This is the Bears Barroom Radio Network. Draft on Tap is rated PG. Parental discretion is advised. With the eighth pick in the 2018 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Roquan Smith, linebacker, Georgia. Well, he might have been the best player in the college football playoff, even though Georgia didn't win the national championship. From the hometown of Montezuma, Georgia, he now goes to join the legends of the monsters of the midway, like Butkus, Singletary, Wilbur Marshall, Furlocker, etc. And here comes Mack again. But Kaiser gets away from him, but not from Schmidt. How's that for the opening play of your career? As Goff fires over the middle and it's intercepted at the 26 yard line. Roquan Smith, the rookie from Georgia, bounced out of bounds inside the five. In the 2018 draft, the Chicago Bears select James Daniels, center, Iowa. Keep in mind, he's a youngster. He won't turn 21 until September 13th, and there are plenty of good things to like in James Daniels' game. 2018 second round pick James Daniels had an excellent rookie campaign, starting 10 games at left guard. With talk now of possibly moving Daniels to center, his more natural position, the sky is the limit for the 21-year-old. With the 51st pick, of the 2018 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Anthony Miller, receiver, Memphis. And how about this, Anthony Miller, there's the reaction in Memphis, Tennessee. He is going to be the latest weapon for Mitchell Trubisky. Trubisky, play action, to the end zone. Second down, Trubisky well protected, wide open. Anthony Miller slips a tackle. Miller to the end zone. Touchdown, Bears! Drink up, our flies. We have another edition of Draft on Tap. And with us today are two great interviews. Colin Thompson, the former tight end of the Chicago Bears who went to Temple and is going to share with us his thoughts on the players coming out of Temple. And Emery Hunt... Longtime friend of the bar room and the czar of the playbook. He is going to be with us just momentarily, but first let me introduce the guys Shane, the smartest man in the bar room, Marsaw, and Danny Shimon, who we are still looking for a nickname to. But tell you what, guys, let's go straight to Emery. He is waiting in the wings. Let's get to it. Emery Hunt, how are you doing, brother? I'm doing fine, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. Great. You are on the line with me, Aldo Gandia. Danny Shimon. Danny, say hi. Hey, Amir. How you doing, man? Cool, man. How's it going? And Shane, the smartest man in the bar room, although he might be the second smartest now that you're in, <laughs> in the bar room. <laughs> I, absolutely. I will bow down to Emery. This guy knows what he's talking about. Awesome follow on Twitter. And Emery, thanks for giving us the time tonight. Anytime, guys. I appreciate you, as always, having me on in the bar room. Hey, Emery. Um, I know that this is the busiest time of the year. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, setting aside some time for us because you, you like Danny and Shane, who have been looking at tape for hours and hours and hours, are probably cross-eyed, drinking a lot of coffee, staying up late at night to, to catch up and, and, and do all your homework on these players. Tell me who of these players who are not big names – have you seen some tape on and said, holy cow, how come more people aren't talking about this guy? Well, w- one guy in particular that I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, is, and it's funny because you, you see a lot of people talk about everybody else at his position, but it's Darryl Henderson out of Memphis, you know, and he has that same element of, of explosiveness and game-breaking ability as does Tariq Cohen, and I'm just shocked that Everyone is is has fallen in love with Josh Jacobs and, and can't explain why they've come out with new formulas to justify their uh, analysis of him being number one at, at that position because he, the tape doesn't show it. But when, every time you look at Daryl, uh, yeah, Daryl Henderson, 
it's, you know, he's always ripping off long runs. He's averaging almost nine yards a carry, 22 touchdowns. He did the same thing last year, almost nine yards a carry. Uh, and it's ridiculous that he is not looked at in the eyes of many as RB1 in this class. I think it's beyond comical. He's going to be a steal for whatever team gets him at whatever round because clearly he's not going to go you know, top 20 if he goes in the first round at all. So he's probably going to be one of the steals of this draft, would you not say? I believe so. I mean, you know, if, if I had to choose to you know, pick a, a surprise first-round pick, you know, like last year Rashad Penny was that guy, um, he was my surprise pick last year, and he ended up going in round one. I would say a team, let's say if a team needs a running back, I think he would be the first one to go uh, more so than everyone's favorite, you know, tailback and in, in Josh Jacobs. Danny, I know you've got uh, Henderson high on your uh, draft board. Uh, share with Emery what your, some of your thoughts on Henderson are. Yeah, I was going to say, Emery, you came to the right bar room, man, because both Shane and myself have been high on, on Henderson as well, the kid out of Memphis. So uh, you, you're right. Uh, in a, the Josh Jacobs love a fest. Uh, I, I see the traits, I see the skill set, but I, I got to see more than just you know 600 some carries or 600 some yards in, a, in the one season. But uh, but just to go off on on, um, on Henderson again, the one thing about him that I do like and I think he brings to any offense is that big play, home run hitting ability, and I, I think that's something that a lot of teams are looking for. So so you do you think because and a lot of the scuttlebutt now is you know he might go fourth round, maybe third round. Do you think there's a chance you think he might go late first or early second? I think so, man. I, I think once you just – if you just took away the name on a jersey and the, the logo on the helmet and, and just watched him run, it's like, my goodness, he's seeing things and able to get there in an explosive manner and is able to turn gaping holes, which has been a criticism of he's running through gaping holes. Okay, fine. But at least he's converting those gaping holes into touchdowns where his backup – who only has eight less carries than Henderson, averaged five and a half yards a carry and over just over 1,100 yards. So if there's a difference between what Henderson does with the ball and what Pollard does with the ball, and it's evident seeing that both guys have the same amount of carries in the same offense. Danny touched on it. I'm a, we're huge Henderson fans here, but a, a guy that I've had my eye on, Emory, I'm not sure exactly how you feel about him, is Alexander Madison. Can you talk about him a little bit? Madison reminds me a lot of, of another back um, that came out of Boise and Jay Ajayi. You know, guys, I think those guys tend to seek out contact more so yeah. than you're supposed to. I'm not as high on him um, because of that reason. You know, I, I feel like there's 40 – Alexander Madison's in the draft, so he doesn't really have a trump card, so to speak, like a, a, a you know a key element in this game that you can say, okay, that's what he brings to the table. Whether it's speed, explosiveness, or the ability to be a threat downfield in the passing game, or elusiveness, or, or just raw power, I think he's an, an okay back. He's more of an R, RB three yeah. at the next level, in my opinion than a feature guy. What about uh, a running back from a small school? Uh, have you looked at any small school, really small schools, uh, that you are impressed with? Um, I'll tell you one thing. This kid from uh, Appalachian State who broke his ankle uh, in the middle of the season and had that outstanding game against Penn State, and, and um, now I'm drawing a blank. Oh, Jalen Moore. Um I'm really impressed with the way he runs. Have you seen tape of Jalen Moore? And, and tell me what you think of him. Yeah, he's my... Uh, 11th back in this class and partly because of the injury you know you don't know how healthy he's going to be and and if he's going to be able to you know be at full strength come training camp so his injury recent injury just kind of knocked him down a little bit because the way they described it when it happened sounded like it was a career ender so we'll see about him but it sounds like he's back running and doing everything that he needs to do to be on the field uh, but he graded out really well for me. Again, he's my 11th back. If you want a small school tailback that uh, you should get familiar with, you should keep your eyes on Xavier Turner out of Tarleton State. Uh, 5'10", about 233. Uh, power, you know, compactly built runner, but got power, burst, explosiveness, and is a downfield threat in the passing game. So when I saw him at the College Gridiron Showcase, was very impressed there. And when I got to the film in February, it's like, wow, this guy really – you know, can pick him up and put him down. He's a, 
Uh, he was tremendous in the Lone Star Conference, which is a, a top conference in Division Two. Ran for over 2,000 yards in, in a competitive backfield. He missed a couple of games in the season, he missed one game because of an injury. The, the backup ran for over 170-something yards. And so he had to wait his turn to get back onto the field to get that start roll back and still was able to go over almost 2,000 yards, if not cross that just barely. So tremendous runner. Uh, I know he had a, a private, uh, you know, top 30 visit with the Cardinals. Um, I know he has a lot of interest with the Cowboys. So he's a guy that's, that no one is talking about um, from a small Division two program, but a good one. Um, and he's a really good tailback. Danny, who do you, uh, what running back would you like to compare notes with uh, Emery? Well, one, one kid, Emery, that I, I've been trying to get my hands on some tape, and that's one thing I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks, is is Darwin Thompson, the kid from Utah State. Um, from what I've seen, just highlights, I mean, the kid's got electric electric feet, uh, ability to jump in and out of holes. He's, he's a bit of, on, on the small side, so I wonder if you've had any uh, extensive scouting of, of Darwin Thompson. Yeah, I have, and um, for him, it's, you know, he, you would think a guy that, is 5'8", 200 pounds, would have that that elusiveness, but that's why you can't judge a book by his cover. I think for him, he's more along the lines of, of what they used to call the scat backs. You know, you want to get those guys out on the perimeter and allow him to use his explosive speed. I still, I felt as though he should have stayed another year at Utah State because I think they have a chance to be special uh, this year with their quarterback, who no one is talking about in Jordan Love. That's probably going to be the top quarterback next year. Everyone is talking about Herbert and Tua. But love is going to be bearing down their throats uh, or their next next season. So I wish he would have stayed for another season. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where he ends. I think he's going to probably end up early in his career as a uh, kickoff returner and seeing spot duty as a, as a third down back. But, you know, he has he has he's more along the lines of uh, what you guys already have on the roster and to uh, take one Mazel. So I, I think that right there is a, is a, a comp for, for Thompson. I wish he would have came back. Really, only had that one year transferring from JUCO, uh, but you know, I wish he would have stayed in at, at Utah State for one more season. Emery, you mind uh, sharing with us who else you've got on that top ten list of RBs? Well, number one is is Henderson. Uh, two is Josh Jacobs, but from Henderson to Jacobs is about a three point drop off. So it's Henderson, Jacobs, Dexter Williams is my third. Uh, Mike Weber out of Ohio State is four. Bryce Love rounds out my top five. Uh, Devin Singletary is six. Damon Harris is seven. Rockwell Armstead is, is eight. Alex Barnes out of Kansas State is number nine. And Darren Hall out of Pitt is 10. It seems like uh, Dexter Williams' stock has been going up since uh, the Senior Bowl, uh, where at that point I would have guessed he was a, maybe a fifth or sixth rounder. But now I'm seeing a lot of reports that he's a third rounder. Um, and, and possibly even higher, although I doubt he's going to be a second rounder. But I've, but uh, there's been a lot of talk. Have you been hearing stuff about Dexter Williams that uh, his stock has been going up? Haven't been hearing anything about stock per se. But when you watch him on film, you see something that the guy in Alabama at Alabama doesn't have is that explosive element to his game to rip off the long run. Um, he only graded out a half point behind. Josh Jacobs in, in my in my grading, so I'm I'm very excited about Dexter Williams. I think the reason why he's a slight he's slightly behind Jacobs, or you could kind of say they have similar grades, is because both guys were, you know, Jacobs was more of the, um, you know, he was a third string guy, he was a comp guy that didn't really get the carries. Williams was there for a long time, but Williams just either was hurt, suspended, didn't really get the reps. And only really had that one year per se of success. So you and, and you know he had his ups and downs. So you want to see if this year was an aberration or was it a trend? I tend to you know side toward the positive side of things, and I think Williams definitely has you know the ability to start and, and be a thousand yard rusher because of what he can do once he gets to that second level. He has that second gear and able to maintain that throughout the play. And we can't ignore the fact that fact that Josh Jacobs only had one run over 20 yards this season. That that's something that that should bring up a lot of red flags. Williams was able to rip off long runs, and and a true testament to that was what his 90 plus yard run uh, against Virginia Tech. Emory, I think he was your uh, number five. Another guy that's uh, higher on my list is, is Devin Singletary. I know a lot of people have been killing the kid for his uh, showing at the combine. But like I said, if you just, I, I watch him on tape and I just, I, I could sit there and just focus on his feet all day long. His feet remind me of, 
of Shady McCoy, just the way that he can and cut and 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 go. Can you t- touch on him a little bit for me? Yeah, for him is it's it's about finding that 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 next level explosiveness. You know, he has the ability to make the guy miss, but the difference between him and Shady is that Shady can make the first guy miss either while going downhill and explode out that cut. Singletary doesn't have that level of explosiveness, which is what showed up at the the combine and, you know, as far as how he ran, how he tested. But, yes, he can make the first guy miss. And, you know, that's always a good element. In in a way, he's similar to Josh Jacobs, who also has the ability to make the first guy miss. But you want to see those guys go beyond that and and really convert that opportunity into an explosive play. Singletary does it more so than Jacobs, but you do like the fact that he can make that first guy miss. I think a lot of people are undervaluing uh, Singletary and what he brings to the table. Hey, Emery, uh, two guys that I think would be nice fits with the Bears system, I I noticed we're not in your top 10, and that's David Montgomery from Iowa State and Trevion Williams from Texas A&M. Just kind of expand on, on why those guys were, were not in your top 10 and, and where are they in terms of your positional rankings for at running back? Well, they're right next to each other. They're 16 and 17. I have uh, Montgomery at 16 and, and Williams at 17. You know, Montgomery is, I think he's the Pierre Thomas of the, the college football landscape. You know, he's a good back, but you always kind of watch him and, and kind of, find yourself saying, yeah, but, you know, we can use somebody that's more explosive. Yeah, we can use somebody that's bigger or, or faster or whatever. You, so he's the type of guy that is probably better as a complimentary back, um, you know, so he may fit well in the bear system. But as far as a, a feature back, I, I don't – he doesn't have that juice that you need. And Williams has a little bit of that that excitement to his game, but I think he's a little bit tight hip, um, which kind of limits his ability to be that consistently – um, explosive player or a guy that you can really lean on and, and trust. So I think for, for him, you know, it's, it's funny to watch a guy in Williams that's about 5'9", 200 pounds, but he has long legs and, and a short torso. So he's kind of he, – he, that kind of knocks his balance off a little bit, uh, which probably l- limits him from being an explosive guy because – you know his body is, is shaped differently, so he has to go about his vic- he have to go he has to go about his his uh, his victories a different way. Um, but I think both guys are, are good productive runners. I just see them more as as RB twos as opposed to RB ones. Why isn't Sanders on your top ten? Sanders is just okay to me. And, you know, not like in a negative way. It's just you know you see a flash play here or there, but we've seen flash plays from Jordan Howard. You know, the former Chicago Bear. We've seen splash plays from other guys. I just don't I think Sanders is probably a specialist third down back at the next level. Um, I know he had uh, he was behind Saquon Barkley, highly touted coming into Penn State, um, but just couldn't. You obviously not going to crack the starting lineup ahead of a Saquon Barkley. But when you had the opportunity, I just felt as though there was a little bit, you know, there was there was. It was good, good production, but wasn't wild wow production. And I know with the advent of social media and, and Twitter clips, uh, you can take somebody's best run and, and circulate it 55 times. And, and everybody thinks that's his whole scout report. But when you watch him in totality, uh, even some of his best plays, you're like, wow, he should have scored on that one. And he ended up getting tackled for a 12 yard gain. I, you know, so I, I think. You know, he has value as a as a you know second back or third back or pass catching back uh, in in a rotation uh, if you're going to go with a, a you know a backfield by committee. All right, let's uh, transfer over to our our talking here to the edge rushers. We're really interested in getting your input on those guys. While we agree that the uh, Chicago Bears are probably going to draft a, a running back in the third or fourth round, I think the consensus here at the bar room is is that perhaps it should be a fourth rounder, and that with the need at edge rushers and to have as many as possible on your on your roster, perhaps if there's a good one there in the third round, that's the guy to get. What do you think about this edge rusher class? And and tell us some of the guys that pop out. There's some some good guys that, that actually would be good situational rushers, which is probably what the Bears need. I love the fact that they brought back Aaron Lynch. I'm a big fan of what he brings to the table. Um, but if you're looking at round three, you're looking at maybe a guy like Daryl Johnson out of North Carolina A&T. 
who was the top pass rusher in the MEAC, came out early uh, from the FCS level, which is rare. And I like what he said, too. He, he, he mentioned that, you know, I, I've developed as much as I can at the collegiate level, and I think I can further develop my game at the professional level. He thought about grad transferring, but it was like, you know what, the, the league had a really good grade on him. I know they, they saw him as a day two talent. Um, so that's a guy that could be there, and that's a, that's one that would fit the mold of what the Bears are looking for, a guy that's 6'4", 6'5", you know, like 240, uh, with room to to grow and gain weight without losing that speed, burst, and ex, ex, uh, explosiveness off the ball. So I think he would be a good one um, in, in round three or four. If you, you're looking even deeper, you look at Kazan Daniels out of Charleston. Everyone talks about his, his teammate, John Kaminsky, uh, but Kazan Daniels was another one that was raising terror out there on that defensive line. And he, he had a really good pro day workout at the Rutgers pro day. Um, and when you watch his production and see him consistently over time throughout the course of a season play well, and then you realize that he had that he's blind in one eye, it makes what he did on the field even more impressive. So that's another player that's probably going to be there in rounds four and five that the Bears could take in and solve their uh, edge rushing uh, needs. What do you think about O'Shane Zimmon as uh, we saw him down at the Senior Bowl? What were your thoughts about his play down there and, and his potential as an NFL player? I thought he did well. I, I think for him, I was more worried, worried about him uh, not having the leverage that you want to see. You know, he plays a little bit too high, but you love the hustle. That's something that you can't teach a coach. And I thought when I went back and watched the film, he's probably more along the lines of a stand-up guy that can play the run, kind of like Lorenzo Carter was last year for the Giants and, and coming out of Georgia, a guy that's a solid run defender that, yeah, can rush the passer, but I think, you know, he still has room to grow in that area. So it's for him, it's going to be about leverage and consistency at, at the NFL level, but he definitely has uh, the, the want to and hustle that, that you can't coach that'll help him get up to speed pretty quickly. Emery, one of the really the enigmas in this edge class that's been talked about this offseason is it uh, Ja'Kai Polite there from Florida. Uh, obviously, the interviews didn't go exactly how he had planned. Um, what have you heard about him moving forward? Kind of where do you expect him to fall in this entire process? And are you a fan of his game overall? I'm a fan of his game, man. I, I kind of liken his game and situation to – uh, Bruce Irvin, when he was coming out of West Virginia, a lot of people talked about Irvin in the same way, and and people were shocked that he went in the first round after they said, oh, he's going to fall because of X, Y, and Z. And I still don't see polite falling out of round one. Um, when you when you heard him talk about his his process uh, during this whole NFL draft process, I love how honest he was, and and I think a lot of it stems back to what happened at the combine. You know, listen to media trying to tell him, you know, or ask him about why he's not running or he has to compete when he knew he was hurting. And now he wants to show, oh, I can compete. I can work hard and I can, you know, fight through injury. And he ended up running a slow time, still nursing the same injury at his pro day and ran a slower time. But you like that he went out there. But to to what avail, how does that help him in a court of public opinion? But when you watch him on film, none of that showed up on tape. He was explosive. He was quick. And he he's a little raw as far as technique, but that's something that you can coach up. But you can't coach, like I said before, the the heart, the want to. He has a knack of of turning the corner and finding his way to the quarterback. And I feel like a team like Dallas or uh, Seattle in the, in round one, Dallas maybe in round two because they don't have first round pick would be an ideal spot for him because you can trust those defensive staffs to really coach up players and coach up techniques. So I don't think he falls far if he falls. Out of the first round, I think he doesn't get past round two. I'm, really, uh, I'm glad you brought up Kazan Daniels. He's, he's a guy that that uh, I've heard about in terms of you know the Charleston kids, and everybody's talking about Kaminsky. But you know, I was like, you could look at this Daniels kid, and I, I did some research on him, and like you mentioned, the the, uh, the the fact that he was blind in one when his right eye didn't tell anybody. His coaching staff, his coaches didn't even know until some of the scouts brought it up to them. Um, he had 30, I think it was 34 and a half sacks uh, for his career at Charleston. Well, do you think because of the um, the injury the, or the issue with the eye, you think he goes undrafted or is there a chance he gets picked up later in, the, in you know, like day three? 
we saw Shaquem Griffin get drafted. He got one arm. So I think <laughs> when you True. look at guys and Daniels, it doesn't matter. If you can if you can get to that that quarterback, they'll put you on the team. And I think Daniels is definitely worthy of a draft pick. Emery, let's move on to another position. Uh, your thoughts at the cornerback level, and again, we're kind of interested on mid-round uh, to late-round draft picks. We saw a couple at uh, the Senior Bowl who caught my attention. Corey Ballantyne is a guy from Washburn who I'm really intrigued by. I love the fact that he's got these long arms. I love the, his his his, his uh, reaction uh, based on what I saw at the Senior Bowl and uh, in a Senior Bowl game. I wonder if this guy is, isn't being overlooked by a lot of people. What's your, what's your thought on Corey Ballantyne and maybe some of the other cornerbacks who might be mid to late round draft picks? I love the athleticism of Ballantyne. He's one of my favorite uh, corners in the class. I graded him as a, a boundary corner. I like him on, on the short side of the field. Um, so he can press. And his press skills are outstanding. And one thing that he has that most boundary corners don't really have is he has uh, the ability to return kicks. He did so at Washburn. And, um, you know, I, I love how he's able to match up in man. You could probably also see a path for him to play in the slot, too. So he's a good player. If you're looking for a small school guy, one guy that's that's starting to get a lot of hype and a lot of talk, and rightfully so, is Stephen Denmark out of Valdosta State, who's a former receiver. He's 6'3", 215. Uh, physical reminds me a lot of, of Cam, uh, not Cam Chancellor, but uh, Brandon Browner and how physical he is in press. He's got good athleticism. He can turn and run with guys. And as a former receiver, he has the hands to make plays on the ball. You also look at Dylan Maven out of Fordham, 6'1", about 196, played high school football in, and ran track with uh, Brown's first-round pick in Denzel Ward. So he's a tremendous athlete. Got a chance to check him out at Fordham, uh, you know, a lot during his career. So I'm very familiar with his game. Again, long corner, good size that can also play field and boundary. You like the small school guys that that have complete game, and he's one of them. He's he's also one of them. So this is a really good class. I think the Bears are, are solid in the secondary because I love guys that they took last year that are now in positions to play significant roles, like Michael Joseph out of uh, Dubuque, uh, Kevin Tolliver out of LSU. Um, so we'll see how you know, where they go. But these, if you're looking at small school guys that could be there later on in the draft for them, those two guys that, that really come to mind uh, immediately. And if you're looking at a slot guy, uh, I, I would say keep an eye on Kiwan Selby out of Delaware State. I was on the broadcast for Delaware State versus Howard and Delaware State versus Morgan State. And Selby made play after play. We previewed him against the Howard in the Howard game as a guy to keep an eye on. I want to say it was a first series. He caught an interception in the end zone. Um, he goes down to the uh, uh, Delaware Pro Day and, you know, was right up there with, if not better in some areas, than um, uh, Adderley from, from Delaware. So mm-hmm. he's here. a 5'8", five, five, corner, 175 pounds, great ball skills. He has a twin brother that's a receiver that's also a prospect, um, Teron Selby. But Kiwan is a guy that has great ball skills, great instincts. You know, people kept trying him because of his height on the outside, and he made him pay every time. He, he was able to high point the ball. You know, he was able to win those 50-50 matchups and kind of was, you know, able to get teams to shy away from throwing on his side. He was able to play off press, uh, turn and run real, really well, and, you know, made plays on the ball. So that's one that, that because of how he tested at the pro day, a very explosive athlete, ran track too. And how he played on film, on, on film, he's probably a guy that's a, a seventh round area that could also, you know, be a priority free agent. And I think he would fit well, uh, kind of in that Buster Screen role for Chicago. I mean, you're talking about you brought up Buster Screen and uh, these slot guys. Can you speak on Jimmy Moreland? He's a guy that I watch. I love the aggressiveness that he plays with, but at the same time. He reminds me a lot of the, the Philadelphia corners that you can always get them with their aggressiveness. They'll bite on those double moves. But it's just a kid that I've always been focused on. Like I said, uh, can you speak on Jimmy Moreland? Yeah, he, he graded out real high for me. He was my third rated slot corner um, in this class behind By- Byron Murphy and Clifton Duck out of Appalachian State. Moreland ball skills. It, I, I joked about this at the East-West Shrine game. You know, every time you look up, he had the ball in his hand and you thought he played offense. 
And he you know, scored. <laughs> he scored, too. And so it, at practice, every day at practice, he had at least an interception. Um, that's, that is what allowed him to get the call up to the Senior Bowl. So Moreland, is, he, he comes from a great secondary. Um, the Packers were able to get a guy last year from James Madison who made the team as an undrafted free agent and, and played a lot last year for them, Raven Green. Um, there's a guy – this upcoming season that's going to be a draft pick probably uh, in that secondary or corner. I thought, and he would have come out this year, but uh, he got injured early in the season and was able to use that red shirt to go back. Moreland was the other guy. So they are well coached down there at James Madison. And it wouldn't surprise me to see Moreland go in round three uh, rather than wow. be a late day pick. It, people Size be damn. He can play. He got ball skills. He can return kicks. He can help you out. He's aggressive. He can blitz. He's not afraid to tackle. So, his play postseason kind of really elevated his stock in the eyes of a lot of uh, media and personnel decision makers, you know, because they want to see how well he can do against top competition, even though that level of the FCS in that conference, you're playing top level competition. Um, and they played well against FBS opponents like NC State this year. So uh, he's he's definitely one that's going to go on on day two, in my opinion. Emory, another guy that I've been uh, keeping an eye on, and, and actually his name is now, I'm seeing it pop up more and more, is this Lace Brown kid from Troy. Uh, a little, little bigger, he's almost, I think, about six feet or six one. Um, it might be more uh, tend to uh, play out, out on, the, on the outside, but uh, what are your thoughts on Blaze Brown from Troy? Former receiver, great ball skills, and people are going to be down on him because of how he tested. He ran a 4-7 at the combine and ran like a 4-6 six something for seven maybe at, at his pro day, but he plays the game really well, you know, and I have him as a, as a field guy. So I love his athleticism. You can trust him out there to turn and run. He's, he's got good press skills. Um, he was also having a really good week of work at the East West Shrine game. I like Blaze Brown. Troy is a, is a really good defensive football team and he played in the Sun Belt conference. You know, they're going to get tested really, uh, you know, extensively as far as in the passing game is concerned and he has good technique, so he's able to to win with his technique despite not having the best speed or explosiveness, but he knows how to play. And again, he's a guy that still has upside uh, because he's still learning the nuances of the position. But again, the ball skills, the ability to play with good technique and um, be able to make plays on the ball and come away with it, you like that about him. And, you know, because of his speed, they're probably going to push him down and, and, and maybe make him a a sixth or seventh round pick, but he's the guy that's definitely going to make the 53. Emory Hunt, I don't know how you do it. You uh, you must get more W-2 forms at the end of the year <laughs> than I have socks in my drawer. <laughs> You're the owner of Football Game Plan. You're a writer, a speaker, an author, an expert over at Sportsline.com. Uh, you write also for The Athletic uh, Fantasy. Uh, that's The Athletic FS, uh, if you want to find them on Twitter. Your Twitter handle is F Game, excuse me, F Ball Game Plan. You're the owner of the site, as I said earlier, footballgameplan.com. If you're not subscribed to Football Game Plan on YouTube, then what is wrong with you? You're missing out on lots of good stuff. Emery, have I done a good job of plugging everything that you're into? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have, man. And we have some exciting news coming down the pike. Uh, we're excited about that in May. We'll announce that once the time comes, but we're working on something big. Uh, also, one thing that we are excited about is footballgameplan400.com. We are now diving into high school scouting. Oh, nice. Um, I don't know if I told you guys before, uh, but we we did a pilot in 2000, uh, 2014. Uh, we had a show called, uh, on Blog Talk Radio, we, we did a show called the... the a uh, high school recruiting roundup where we had high school players call into the show, send us their huddle link, and we gave them an evaluation live on air. Nice. And one guy we talked to, um, it was one of the three guys that, that gave us the idea to, to run with the 400. Um, one guy we talked to was like, man, you got great technique. Uh, you know, if somebody just was patient with you and let you gain weight, because he was a small, he was about 230 um, playing playing tackle. And we was and playing guard, and she was like, you know, you, you got the technique, and once they add the weight, because college will add the weight, you're going to be a monster because you got good technique, and now you have the weight to go along with it. Because he was feeling kind of, he was like, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know, I had some questions, people always question my size, blah, blah blah. And fast forward to this year, that dude is Chris Lindstrom. 
And so, oh. so we saw who was down at the, nice. uh, we was down at the Senior, Senior Bowl. Bowl yeah. And right, he, we, I interviewed him. He was like, "Man, I appreciate what you said. You know, way back then, like, you know, you guys are were pretty honest, and it was pretty on point." Um, one guy, another guy, we talked about and had on the show. Uh, he said people was questioning his size and whether or not he had to move to safety or could he play linebacker at the collegiate level. And we was like, "Now nah, you fit the mold, actually, of the new age linebacker." And Fast forward to last year, that was that guy was Jerome Baker, you know. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so we 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 thought like, man, we're hitting on a lot of guys, man, and and so we started we started scouting guys back in July, and we were able to unveil our initial list, which is the football game plan 400, um, which is on uh, online right now. So just go to footballgameplan400.com. It's gonna be fun to track these guys. Uh, throughout the course of their collegiate career. And so now when we do our draft stuff, we can always say, hey, so-and-so was a football game playing 400 uh, player. He was the the fourth overall quarterback. And now he's this in our football game plan scouting uh, draft grade. So we're excited about that. Our next list, uh, next crop of 400 will come out in August. So, you know, it's, a, it's another piece of the puzzle that we're they're adding to the foot we're adding to the football game plan family and, and we're definitely excited about that you could also follow on twitter at fbgp400 to check out our list and you know all the upcoming videos and uh interviews that we have down the pike as well so we're we're covering all bases here emory before we let you go one thing you kind of piqued my interest a little bit earlier when you were t- just talking about the bears depth chart at running back are you high on uh Taquan Mizell? I'm more high on Ryan Nall than I am on uh, yep. Mizell. And so the fact that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that. You know, Nall, Nall was a guy we talked about on this show, man. Yep. And I'm glad he made the team a really good back. I'm glad they brought in Mike Davis. And the fact that, you know, they decided that, hey, we don't no longer need the services of Jordan Howard. You already know my stance on Tariq yep. Cohen and what I thought about that. I think they should just go ahead on just let Cohen just lead dog and try to sprint out in front and use guys like Davis and all to close out the game, you know, and if they, if, even if they would have kept Howard, I felt as though that if they played it in reverse, it would have been much better for both players. Cause you allowed your offense to play fast with Cohen, get a big lead. Then you, you know, you could pull Cohen out the game and allow Howard to close it. But if you try to, you know, switch and, and, pull guys in between games. It changes the offense. Howard always slowed the offense down. He's better in the four minute offense more so than he is when you're in the second quarter trying to, you know, get a lead or, or, you know, get back in the game. Like, you know, I felt as though they could have worked together if they just swap roles, but now we'll see if they'll lead with Cohen and allow guys like Davidson, Nall, and even Mazzell at some point to close it out. So we'll see. I'm excited to see what the bears do this year. I was excited about them last year. I think this team is still, uh, stacked and, and ready to, to get back into the playoffs, honestly. Emery, thank you very much for your time. We're going to bug you again post-draft so that you can help us figure out who some of these guys are and give us your, your opinion on them. So hopefully, hopefully you're available. And if there's anything that you need from any of us here at the bar room, please don't hesitate to, hesitate to ask. You've been great with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys, man. Take care, buddy. Thanks, Emery. Appreciate it. Thanks, Emery. Have a good night. You too. Thompson, are you there? I am here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Say hello to Danny Shimon. He's our uh, draft, uh, one of our draft experts here. Uh, Danny, say hi to Colin. Hey, Colin. How are you doing tonight, man? Thanks for joining us. Hey, Dan. I'm doing great. Thank you. And also with us is Shane, the smartest man in the bar room, Marsaw. Shane, say hi. Hey, Colin. What's up, man? We need a tight end. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment. Oh no! <laughs> well, I was going to start this interview by asking just where things are with your uh, professional playing career. Anything uh, you want to share with us? Yeah, so just finished up with the uh, the AAF, and you know, I, it's it's been storied, it's been documented, everyone's seen the ups and downs of that football league, and. I'll speak for what we did in Birmingham. I thought it was pretty special. Uh, I thought that was the norm across the league. Well, I come to find out later what we did there operationally, um, starting with our head coach and our general manager and and the staff behind the scenes there. Everything was smooth sailing, I thought, for the most part. We had all the big things covered. 
starting with, you know, travel and food and a field and a facility. Uh, I come to find out later that um, other teams aren't even paying for people's hotel rooms. Um, you know, people were working out in gold gyms uh, as a team. So uh, I guess as a whole, uh, the AAF was an interesting place. I loved playing there. Uh, it restored my love for the game, even though it never went anywhere, but I was able to be the starter. I was able to be the backup. I was able to have all these different roles. I was able to long snap as well, which I also do. So that was a fun opportunity. I was in the AAF for six weeks there from week two to week eight with the Birmingham Iron and what an opportunity it was. But now just waiting for the draft to finish for the dust to settle, um, you know, and, and work my way back onto a football team hopefully in the NFL. Well, we hope so, too. We're big fans of yours. Uh, saw you play. You're a great blocker. Uh, I mean, you've got underrated hands. Uh, we, we hope to see you on a professional football field, and if it's with the Chicago Bears, man, that would be fabulous. Uh, let's go on and now talk about a little college football, the NFL draft happening a week from today as we're recording. Um, Colin, I, I'd like to start by asking you about the Temple players that uh, are coming out of the draft. Uh, before I headed down to the Senior Bowl, you told me to keep an eye on a couple of guys, and one of them was Rock Yon Sin, the cornerback. Tell us, uh, give us your scouting report on Rock. Well, I think the first scouting report to me starts off the field. It actually starts on the wrestling mat. Uh, he's a two-time state wrestler. Excuse me, two-time state champion in the state uh, of Georgia as a wrestler. Uh, this is a cornerback we're talking about. This isn't a linebacker or a fullback. This is a cornerback. This is a guy who's extremely tough, um, who is very physical, and he checks all the boxes with the speed. You know, he, he, he ran a 4-5. He's strength-wise, 18 reps of bench for a corner is very good. And he's 5'11", 191. You know, that's right on par with – what the average is in the NFL. So to me, I don't know if he's going to be there after day one. If he slips to day, th- day two, I could see a team moving up to take him that once a corner. He is, he's a guy, like I said, with the wrestling stuff that almost represented our country in the Olympics. This is a, an elite person to start with that off the field and then on the field. He competes at a high level. He'll play on punt return. Uh, he'll run down as a gunner. This is a guy who's going to play 10-plus years in the league. Um, not a question about it. I saw him in practice because I trained at Temple in the offseason, uh, preparing uh, when I got released by the Bears. That's where I worked out every day. And then I did the sideline reporting, color commentary for Philly Sports Talk Radio for Temple games. So I was up close and personal with these guys this year and really one of the guys that stood out to me. And really everybody, including people at the Senior Bowl and the Combine, was Rocky Sin. He, he, and a, a lot of talk about him moving up in the draft. There, you know, when we were down at the Senior Bowl, the talk was more third, fourth rounder. But now I've even seen him as high as the bottom of the first round. Uh, what a, what have you been hearing? That is what I've heard as well. You know, again, we could sit here all day and make mock drafts, and you, you just never know what happened, right? I mean, um, you just don't know what happens. He, he could, he could fall. He could rise. Meet, you know like a meteor, you, you never know. There's a guy by the name of Shreve Floyd. He's out of the NFL now. He played for the Vikings. And he's a Philly guy, and I played with him in Florida. And Sharif was a second-round pick, I think, you know, a couple weeks before the draft. And then all of a sudden, like a week before the draft, some projections came out that the Raiders were going to take him number one overall. He ended up slipping to the Vikings, I think, middle of the pack first round. And you're like, wow, this guy was a second-round pick. You know, he's the number one pick. What is he? So you never know. We'll see what happens. But, yes, you're right. I'm here in late first round, early second. Danny, you were down at the Senior Bowl. You took a close look at Rock Johnson. Share with Colin your thoughts about him. Yeah, Colin, I met the kid. Uh, got a chance to talk to him, and he's a real, you know, uh, honest kid, it looks like. You know, it's just uh, someone like they came across, like, you know, uh, humble and, and really ready to work and, and hardworking. My question for you is, looking at his tape, I, I see a press cover corner, but you'd mentioned you know, his testing at the combine. I think some teams are seeing him now as, as an off coverage corner. What, what do you think he best uh, sits? Is he, is he better in, in, in press man cover or is, is he an off corner? Or, or could he do, is he scheme versatile? Can he do both? I think he's scheme versatile. And, and I, I'm, I, I'm not, 
biased because I, I try to look at, I try not to be biased, but at Temple, they ran multiple defenses. Jeff Collins, he ran multiple defenses when he was, when he was at Mississippi State, and they had a great defense there. And back in the Dak Prescott era, he ran a great defense at Florida. Um, it was the Jim McElwain era there, and then he becomes the head coach at Temple. And I've seen Rock do it all, drop into coverage uh, into deep third there and cover three. I've seen him drop into deep four and cover four. And I've seen him as cover two come up and make big tackles on like maybe say a bubble, bubble, little flare screen. You know, they're trying to take advantage of the smaller corner. He's not somebody you could take advantage of. And then I think physically he's going to be able to match up with a lot of receivers in the NFL because of his, you know, like I said, his physicality, the wrestling background. This is not a former basketball player. This is a former wrestler. So I think he can do both. I think he is versatile and, you know, you never know what happens until you get on the NFL field and you're facing Julio Jones. You're facing the top wide receiver in the NFL, Allen, Allen Robinson, these guys that are masters of their craft. So it should be interesting to see, but I think he can do both. Colin mentions his, his wrestling background, but and you can see that in the way he comes up and he, and he attacks uh, in terms of run defense. He attacks the, the running back and he wraps up. He's, he's a sure tackler in the open field. That's one thing a lot of these teams are, are looking for now, especially if you're playing cover, you know, if you're playing, asking your guys to play coverage to come up and run defense and wrap up and tackle, and Rocky Sin will do that. Yep, no, no question, hundred percent. And I, I think that, I think if you're sitting in a room and your defensive coordinator sitting across the table, you're like, listen, I like this guy. Why not take him? Like he's a sure thing to me. I mean, in a world of, you know, as we know, not so such sort sure thing. I think with his work ethic and his personality, a guy that played at, you know, Presbyterian College to come to Temple and in one year become a first-round pick, pretty impressive. Colin, I'm really interested in getting your opinion on running back from Temple, Rockwell Thompson, uh, excuse me, Rockwell Armstead. This guy uh, I was super impressed with his play down at the Senior Bowl. Um, just yesterday he was on Good Morning Football and he was asked to look at the camera and tell a GM what he, uh, uh, what that team would get if, uh, if they drafted him. And the first thing he said, he, he said, it's someone that will respect the program. Secondly, someone who will dominate as special teams. Third, a violent runner. Fourth, a guy that can run and catch. I mean, you couldn't have scripted that better for a young man to say that and say it with conviction, straight to the camera, talking to all 32 general managers. Have you met this guy? Tell me what he's like and, and give us your assessment of him as a football player. Well, I'm, I'm flooded with emotion a little bit because this is a guy that he was my favorite player. One of my, I mean, I played with such, so many great players at Temple. Uh, and if you guys seen around the league, Temple football has, has put itself on the map. And in the last four years, five years, Temple football has been a substantial part. You can't write the story of college football season without it. And this is a player that came in and played right away as a freshman. Um, first off, you're going to get a great father. I think he makes that apparent at Temple. And Matt Rule and Jeff Collins embraced that. And his kid was his child was always around. And he's a great father. Secondly. He's smart. He knows how to, how to act, what to say at the right times. He gets it. He's a guy who gets it, right? A lot of people look at the TV or look at football and see the celebrations or see this and see that and say, do these guys not get it? And I find myself saying the same thing sometimes too. But here's a guy who gets it. And Rocco Arm said it. He is, first off, a great person, great father. I said that. He checked all the boxes at the Senior Bowl. He checked all the boxes at the combine and a guy, like I said, I blocked for for two seasons. And I think too, right. You see him, these power runs at temple. And I'm sorry, I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit because I know this is a guy that everyone's going to be interested in. He is your mid round pick running back that everyone wants to turn into their superstar, right? Alvin Kamara, the list goes on and on. Uh, Jordan Howard, right. Your, your pro bowl back that you find mid round, but this is a guy that got blocked for two seasons. Um, he's going to be a, in my opinion, a great NFL running back. He's a physical runner. Um, I see him like a Tevin Coleman type where he can affect the screen game as well, but also gash you up the middle. But he's 15 pounds heavier than, than uh, Tevin Coleman as well. So very crafty in the hole. Uh, I think he creates his own. Um, and he's had some great coaching. He coached Louisiana and coached Lucas in college. But what's pressed me the most, though, I'll be honest with you, is his breakaway speed. 
you think he's a physical runner, and most physical runners don't have that fourth, fifth gear. Watch the USF game, Temple 2016. Turn that game on YouTube. Uh, I think the full game's on there. He is unbelievable. Uh, we run a lot of jumbo sets. I play a lot of wing neck game. He is breaking tackles. He is running, and he's pulling away from these guys at USF at the back end, which we know is a pretty fast back end. So he's been a part of multiple offenses, multiple coaching staffs. And I think in a screen game with Coach Nagy and Coach Helfridge, and like you said on Twitter, is he going to be able to rat, run those routes out of the backfield? I think he does. I think he checks all the boxes. And another thing, too, is pass protection-wise, he is not a liability. He will butt up a linebacker, um, and he's got great technique with it. So he is your perfect mid-round running back that I'm sure Bears fans would love to have. Colin, you, you brought up Tevin Coleman, and one thing that I've always noticed way back when even when he was – you know, Indiana days and then moving forward was it always appeared to me like he had a lack of vision. And that is to me is something that I did have down in my notes about Armstead was his just, I don't know if it's, it just seemed like he had a, that, that narrow vision. Like if he saw it, like you said, he could, he could take it and, and go. And another thing too, is obviously him as a pass catcher. Do you, I know you kind of alluded to it there, but you feel completely confident that he can, he, he's going to be a guy that can make some plays um, off of the screen game and, and downfield as a pe- pass catcher because obviously he's got you know the minimal production there in the, you know, as, a, as a pass catcher. You feel pretty confident about that? Yeah, I'll say this too, guys, in the future with numbers. You know, the, yeah, I think it was, what, 25 catches over his career. I don't really – to me, college, there's so many guys in the roster. Yep. They'll say, okay, we're going we're gonna to put this gimmick guy in a running back and run him down the scene. You know, like there's, you don't get in the NFL where you're going to see Tariq Cohen like 50 times a game because really there's only two other running backs, right? So in college, they have this guy, a guy by the name of Isaiah Wright, who is, was their gimmick running back receiver, guy's a freaking nature quarterback. He's going to be an NFL guy that we'll be talking about this time next year. I know they used him a lot out of the backfield in, in the spring game. But to me, I don't think he's a liability catching the ball at all. Um, I don't think that the number to whatever the catches really matters. Uh, can he catch? Yes. Is he going to run routes like Tariq Cohen? I don't think so. I don't know any other routes, Ken. A guy on the team, I'm not going to name him, pretty much told me he runs routes better than Darren Sproles. No one can run a route tree like Tariq Cohen out of the running back. But, you know, he's very unique. So I think if you have a complimentary piece to that, that's a wonderful thing. And I think Rock Paul Armstead is that complimentary piece. Danny, your thoughts? Hey, Colin, uh, yeah, on, on Rock Paul, when I was watching this tape, he looked like he was bigger uh, in terms of, of size, I mean, he, they listed him at 215, but at the combine, or actually at, at the senior bowl, he looked lighter. It looked like he lost weight. Uh, but at the combine, he was listed at 220. So do you know where he was at? Did he lose weight after the after the season? Did he get, you know, to, or, or, sorry, to get you know faster and quicker for, for the combine? I'm kind of confused there with, with him. I'm sure he bulked up a little bit and slimmed down. I think everybody got everybody does too. And another thing you got to realize too, these guys are going through the – your, your training goes from college that you finish the end of your season to now you've got, you have a full-time chef at your training place. You got every, your agents taking care of all that. Um, you got a week, you travel, you got all your meals, everything. You have a personal trainer, everything, everything changes from follow the team, just get ready to play. If you're dinged up week to week to now, we're going to craft your body like a professional athlete should. So he's never had an issue with his conditioning. He's never had an issue really with his health, knock on wood. Um, so to me, I don't, you know, I don't see him as a bruiser. I don't see him like I, I, I compare him to Coleman and I do think he's got good vision. I, I think that that could be one of his strengths in the league. I really think he does create holes just a little different with that spread offense in college. It's kind of hard to see, but, um, to me, I don't see him as that bruiser. He says he's a physical bulldog and he is a physical bulldog, but he, he's not Jordan. And I mean, Jordan Howard, Jordan's big old boy. And we, and you guys know that. So uh, I think he's a mix of a mix of him and Tariq, if that's, you know, safe to say. Really fascinating uh, analysis of, of this guy. And I think a lot of people like myself who kind of overlooked him or bypassed him thinking maybe, maybe he's too much like Jordan Howard. I think we're now taking a, a, a closer look. On top of that, we've heard rumors that the Bears might be interested in him. So we'll be taking a look at him. I want to move now to uh, Michael, and, and correct me if I'm mispronouncing the last name here, Michael Dogby. The, uh, Perfect. 
Thank you. Six foot three, two hundred and eighty five pound defensive end. Uh, what do you know about him? What can you share with us? Well, Mike, first off, he's just an unbelievable person. He's a guy that, you know, we, we, when I transferred in, we came in at the same time. He came in as a freshman. This guy is a workaholic. Um, I talk to Mike frequently. Uh, has a little bit of a mentor role with Mike. And, you know, he's, he's constantly, where do you see this? How does this go? I know he's had workouts with NFL teams already. I know he's made some visits with some NFL franchises as well. Um, this is a guy who works extremely hard. When I was at Temple, again, when I got released from the Bears, I was living there, working out, training, trying to mimic what a normal player would do. So I would, if a team called, I'd be ready to go. And Mike lived in that weight room, stretching, lifting, whatever it was. This guy is sculpted out of marble. I mean, he's 285, no body fat. Um, 34 rep bench. He's strong as an ox. If you want to watch a game, turn on the Maryland game from last year. That's the best game I suggest to watch. Um, what a stud. Showed up against the Big Ten offensive line. When Temple lost to Villanova and Buffalo, and they went down to Maryland, the team that beat Texas the week before, and they whooped them. And a lot of it is because of Mike Dogby. So he's a legitimate player. I don't know where he fits in that scheme. Uh, they have a lot of great players. I don't know if he wants to go there. Uh, there's a lot of really good players in that in that front four, front five, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, so but Mike's a great person, one, and he's a perfect fit. He's, and he would be a perfect Chicago Bear if he ended up there. Do you see Michael as a interior three technique, or do you think he can stand up on his feet and, and play some outside? Well, I think you know it depends what they want to do with him weight wise, right? If they start, if, if he gets up to the two ninety, then I think he's an inside guy. Uh, if they say, "Hey, Mike, we're going to lose a little bit of weight," then sure, he moves well enough on his feet. He's you know he he's got great you know swim move, the rip. He's got great moves for an interior guy, in my opinion, because I played against him on the outside of well, Temple. He can move, he needs to, but I do see him more as a true interior guy, maybe in a 4-3, he's your 3-tech. Uh, you know, in the 3-4 defense, he's your 5-tech. Uh, he's 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 really, he's in great shape, and he would be willing probably to do both because he works so hard at his diet and his, his body. He could move both inside and out if need be. One of the things that I've seen in some of the scouting reports about Dogby is his hands. People keep talking about how great his hands are. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, I can. I, I worked with, when I was at uh, uh, Temple. He worked with Elijah Robinson, who's now defensive line coach for Texas A&M, and uh, I, I was really able to see the post-practice work with their hands. And I, it made me think to myself, why don't I go through that? Now, tight end, I don't need that as much. But when you're trying to get a release on a linebacker or you're trying to get off these guys at defensive line position, it can help. Mm-hmm. Anything can help. Mm-hmm. Um, very impressive with his hands. Again, I think it has to do with your work ethic. Mm-hmm. If those little intricacies of your work, if your game are right, then it's your work ethic. If you're going to run over guys and you know, you're going to be able to do all these leaping and bounding and high-pointing the ball, more athletic things, that's just got to give an ability. But the little hand drills – um, the one-handed catches, all the little things that fans are wowed by. Maybe when you get to a practice that you don't see in a game, uh, like if you go to a Bears camp and you see these guys doing all this crazy stuff, really it's earned on the field. It's earned after practice. It's earned before practice. And Mike was the perfect fit for that, and his work ethic would make him a perfect bear. Kyle, when you're talking about a, a bigger guy with him, one thing that I did have written down on him is, you know, you talked about his agility even at the – the bigger size, but his spin move was pretty impressive. Something that he used actually quite a bit. I mean, it's obviously not Dwight Freeney like. I don't think anybody is. But can you just speak on his uh, his agility for a big guy like that? It's it's so impressive. Yeah, Mike has always been mobile. I think he's like a, he's like a little guy in a, in a big man's body. He you know he, he he's just made out of marble. Like he's made out of granite. This guy is a freak. Um, he is chiseled, you know, so he can do things that a lot of guys that weigh 285, 290 pounds can't do. He takes his body very seriously. Uh, and he's really been built from the ground up. This is a guy that came in at Temple. I think Mike came in at like 240 pounds. So he's put on about 10 pounds per year of pure muscle. So he's learning to play defensive end position. Well, oh, wait, now you're a defensive tackle at 290. Very similar to like you see like LeBron James or like a Ben Simmons to give it, you know, or uh, uh, an onto the Kupo or a Joel Embiid where when they were younger, they played point guard. But, oh, wait, now they're 6'10", 6'11", 
similar to like a Magic Johnson. Now you're a 6'10", 6'11", point guard. So I think it's a very similar thing where Mike moved from DN at 240 to now 285, 295 uh, pound uh, defensive tackle. Um, Danny, any thoughts on Dogby before we move on? Dogby, I, I'm just going to have to uh, do some more research on him because I, I did see him more as a, as a 4-3 interior guy, but now Colin's got me thinking, you know, maybe maybe bulk him up and, and stick him inside at, in, or in a bear scheme, I'm thinking here, right. as a 5 technique. So I, I got to take a look at I that. Just don't see him, I just don't see him standing up out there with, you know, with Leonard and Lynch and, you know, and Khalil. I just – I don't see – him out fitting in as well out there as he would inside. Colin, do you think he could have the potential to kind of, I'm not trashing the guy, but do you think uh, maybe he could be what the Bears have been wanting for so long from from Bullard? Oh, John? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, did, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I haven't followed as well as John. Did John resign out there? Is he still there? He's still there, yeah. Yeah, I think, I. you know, I, I played with, I played at Florida with John. Um there's so much depth on that team, and I think John's a part of that depth. I think John's a part of that pass rush. I know it's it's tough to see at the interior defensive line position, the, you know, the quality of player. I think because a bull rush just looks like a like a block for the offensive line, but that wears on guys. And I think John presents that. John's strong as an ox. Um, numbers wise, it's really hard to produce the inside unless you're a Keem Hicks. <laughs> you know, he's a free. Yeah. He's unbelievable. You know, he's. A, so good to me he's the most underrated player in the nfl um so no i think john john you know he's all the ability to make plays and 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 do things in tier he's got all the talent for sure and i know he was a higher pick so people people want to match that pick with the output but i think john will have a great year there's a ton of depth in that defense i don't see why not Let's talk about Dalvin Randall. Uh, I think he's the last of the Temple players that's coming out for the draft, the safety. Uh, flying under the radar a bit, some scouts yep. are, are not uh, – uh, have been punching him a little bit for his 4.71 40 run at the pro day. Uh, but nonetheless, this guy is, is – always seems to be around the ball. He's got 12 career interceptions as a three-year starter. What can you tell us about Dalvin Randall? Well, this is a guy, another guy who dominated in our sport. He had Division one offers to play point guard uh, mm. all over the state of Pennsylvania um, and to play basketball. So he, he's an athlete starting there. Fifth all-time in Temple history in interceptions. He had four interceptions his sophomore, junior, and senior year. As a junior, he had 80 tackles. As a senior, 85 tackles. So this is a guy that's, have averaging more, you know, more tackles than linebackers the safety position. And I'm not saying okay that they break free for 10 yards. He just happens to grab their ankle. He lays the wood. If you want an undrafted player or a late round pick, probably undrafted, mm -hmm. to replace Adrian Amos. Uh, and Adrian's a stud. Obviously, he got paid very well by the Packers. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is the closest thing you'll find undrafted, in my opinion. The four seven one to me is whatever. Uh, sure, is he going to run back there like Ed Reed and get 10 picks a year? I, I don't know if anybody can. Eddie Jackson sure does. He's on his way. He's a very good player. But he's not Eddie. He's not as long and rangy as Eddie. 5'11", 210, but he lays the wood, ultra-physical, and I think he's a great replacement uh, or, or try to come in and compete for that you know that open safety spot that, well, I guess HaHa -Ha would be there. Right? That's, tough. That's a tough place to play now, but uh, yeah, he's he's a stud. He's under the radar with that four seven one, but a guy that's played a ton of football for Temple and a guy that will be experienced and is willing to make plays on special teams. Let's want let's change our focus now. Hey, before we go, I have one more guy for you. Okay, cool. I don't want to. I'll be quick. I, to me, take your time. There's a couple guys, but just fitting into what I what I know about the Bears. One tight end, Chris Meyer, an undrafted tight end. Type guy, I think he can do a little bit of everything. He's an undrafted guy to watch out for. And then Ben Tell Bryant, he is one of the best wide receivers in college football. Uh, hmm. He's had a catch in every single game in his career at Temple. Every single game. Hmm. Um, he's a long and lanky wide receiver at 6'3, 209. He ran a 4 5 5 40. He's got the most receiving yards in Temple football history, and no one's talking about him. Hmm. He will make an interactive roster next year as a wide receiver. So, uh, somebody to keep an eye out for. Ben Tell Bryant 
maybe go back to a little digging on him. Great player. Came in and played right away as a freshman. He's out of Florida, and he's a stud from Temple. I know you want to move on to some other guys, but there are two guys, Chris Myrick um, Del, and, uh, and Ben Tell Bryant, that I think could come in and make a team. No, I'm glad you brought those guys up. Uh, we'll definitely do some homework on them and talk further about them in upcoming shows. And who knows, if they – if they uh, end up with the Chicago Bears, we'll be calling Colin Thompson again, <laughs> so he can tell yeah, us well, more. The Bears are going to be very active in the UDFA market because I mean they're they're yeah. still way under the ninety man limit right now. So lack of you know, yeah, lack of draft picks. So they're going to be they're going to be bringing in a lot of these guys that Colin's mentioning right now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely right. All right, let's focus on uh, tight ends, Colin. I know you've been doing some scouting work on the tight ends in this class. Give us some names of some of the players that you think are uh, could potentially help the Chicago Bears or just players in general that you say, man, these, this guy is a stud and keep an eye on him. Yeah, so there's there's the big three at the top with T.J. Hawkerson, Noah Fant, and Irv Smith Jr. Hawkerson and Fant are both projected right, first-round picks, top 20 picks in that matter, and they're both out of Iowa. Uh, last year they put out Kittle. You know, the list goes on and on with these Iowa tight ends. They just keep coming. Uh, and they just keep dominating. I'll start with Hawkerson, top guy, 6'5", 251. He's got legit speed. When I watched the film, I said legit speed, legit strength, balance of the ball in his hands. He's physical as heck as a blocker. Um, and then I saw he ran a 4'7", which surprised me. I would have said he's a 4'5", you know, 4'6", four, four, guy. But that shows his game speed. Um, he'll go for you. He'll go over you. He's jumped over plenty of guys. He's a scoring threat in the red zone. He's your next type of Gronk type player where to me, there's very few Gronks on this planet. Um, he was unbelievable. He changed the game blocking and he stretched the, the game down the seam. I think Hawkerson's your next guy to do that. I don't know if the Bears, if he would be a fit for the Bears. Obviously, he's going to be a first round, early first rounder. And then Fant, you know, he's a little slender. He's got a little smaller frame, 6'4, 249. To me, I put speed, speed, speed after his film. Ran a 4'5. And again, 6'4", about 250. He's got a great frame, great size. Um, he's the future of the league, right? This catching tight end, this mismatch tight end, we're going to motion you out. If a linebacker comes out on you or a safety comes out on you, we're throwing you the ball. Um, and then Herb Smith uh, with um, Alabama made big catches this year. He was a part of that offense. I, could, I just remember him catching. There's a bunch of balls over the middle on that base hit, that 10-yard in route. 6'2", 242, though, so he's smaller. He reminds me of Delaney Walker, a guy that can do a little bit of everything. Um, wouldn't be surprised if Tennessee took him. I know Delaney got hurt last year and missed the end of the year, but he's a stud Pro Bowl-type player. And then I'll give you one guy that I think could, could potentially be with the Bears, and that's uh, a, 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 a Trayvon Wesco, um, or Trevin Wesco with, out of West Virginia. Mm-hmm. 6'4", 270. Made the late round guy. Uh, if you if you want a, a great Instagram, great Twitter follow, it's Brian Baldinger. He breaks down a lot of players, and one of the guys he brought down broke down about a month ago uh, was was Trevin Wesco, and then it brought him to my attention. But here's a guy who can do some things in the pass game for being 270, pretty impressive um, in, in that spread offense. There, he did a lot of motioning, a lot of shifting, a lot of stuff that the Bears do, and at 270, he can come in and play and impact the line of scrimmage right away. And a as a blocker, as a pass blocker, be involved in the screen game. So Wesco is a guy, excuse me, that could come in and be an undrafted guy for the Bears or a late round pick uh, and, and make an active roster, even though he would be undrafted. Colin, uh, is it difficult for a new tight end to come into this team and, 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 and become proficient in just one season, uh, with Matt Nagy's offense, are you saying that in a U tight end meeting like a Trey Burton? Yeah, it, it just seems to me like it's a huge challenge, um, given the complexities of what Nagy does. But you would know better. Well, I, I'll tell you what; it's been the best offense I've been a part of in my years. It made the most sense. Um, guys are always running open. Uh, it just felt right for me. For a lot of guys, I think a lot of guys can test to it. And this offense isn't run just by Matt Nagy. It's the Ravens run it with Marty Morningweg, who's no longer with them. But Kansas City runs it. Uh, the Eagles run it with Doug Peterson. So this is an offense around the league that a couple teams run. 
that old West Coast that started with Mike Holmgren back in the day, Steve Mariucci and Brett Favre. It's the same thing. It's obviously developed, and Coach Nagy's a brilliant mind offensively, and he's got a great staff there. But I think the tight end position is one of the hardest ones to pick up in that offense because you're asked to do so much. But I honestly, I'll take it. It creates a great value for the position. They use multiple tight end sets. I think if the help was better at the position last year, you would have seen more multiple tight end sets. Uh, talk about a great group, probably one of the better groups, top to bottom in the, in the NFL. But I think injuries has hurt the group in general, starting off with Adam getting hurt in camp, and then sadly Dion got another concussion, and all of a sudden – you know, you're thin at the position. Dan Brown got hurt in the last preseason game. Um, Dan, uh, ben Broniker got hurt in training camp. So, you know, it's a deep group. Uh, and, you know, this year it's it's a little a slimmer with the departure of some guys. But I think they'll bring in some guys. And, and uh, again, to answer your question, it's a complex offense, no doubt. But I think it's, it's, it's hard for everybody to pick up in your first year. I think you'll see more Trey next year. Uh, he's a dynamic player, a uh, great person, and he can do a little bit of everything for the Bears on and off the field. Colin, knowing what you know, like you said, with it being a little bit uh, slim in the depth chart, you know, Trey Burton, Adam Shaheen, and actually when we had you on before, you were you were talking up Broniker, you know, about how, you know, athletic and fast, you know, he is. And I was really glad to see them bring him back. What, what type of of a tight end do you think that Nagy would want to, to blend in with that group? I'm looking at a kid like Foster Moreau from LSU. And I think, you know, the, this yeah. kid, I think he gets killed a lot because he's not the guy, like you said, that's going to get down the seam and make a bunch of plays in the pass game. But I still think that there's a lot of upside there for him just in that LSU offense. He didn't get a lot of chances. And I mean, he's such an aggressive blocker. I could, I could run tape back on him and just watch the, that kid block all day long. I love it. Is that a kid that you yeah. like at all, and do you think that he would fit in? Yeah, he was, he was a guy that's on my nose as well, um, and I wanted to give you the three bigs and then maybe a guy I would think undrafted. I think Foster, you know, 20, 22 catches, 272, two touchdowns, right? It sounds a lot like my college numbers. Mine were even lower. But he's a part of that LSU offense where they're flipping that ball back there and they're going to ground and pound on that clock and play great defense. To me, you know, there's plenty of great tight ends that have been a part of that system. 6'4", 253. He's not overwhelmingly overwhelmingly heavy. He looks a lot bigger than that, though. I saw two. When I saw 253, I was a little shocked. I think that's a great – I think it's a great answer. Him or Westfield to come in and be physical with that group. I think Adam has grown to become physical, but he's like a big Trey Burton. You know, he's like a big crump. Uh, Trey, obviously, has been more of a receiver. He's got the shovel passes. He's like a he's a gadget guy that can do a little bit of everything. And then Ben's a pure speed guy that's physical. He's got the frame, great athlete. So, again, I think that's a great um, fourth, fifth tight end option with the Foster Monroe's and the Wesco and some of the bigger, more pro-style guys. I think that would be a good, healthy blend for that group led by Kevin Gilbright uh, Jr., I'm looking at guys because, like, like you said, I'm looking at guys that give them an option in in terms of like you know sh- stretching the seam, right? So two kids that really caught my eye. They're West Coast kids, so I'm not sure if you had a chance to take a look at them. One is a uh, Cali Waring from San Diego State, and the other one is Josh Oliver from San Jose State. Have you had a chance to take a look at those two kids? Yeah, so Oliver, he's six five, two forty nine. He, you know, he's not a blocker, uh, but. You know, he's like an H-back type guy in the slot. You know, he's like a big slot receiver. Um, but, you know, crazy athlete. I could see, you know, the thing with the tight end position is, I guess it'll fill you guys in on it. If you look at the NFL, there's like 35 legitimate top stars. You guys can probably name them all, maybe even less. Uh, and then the rest of us, I should say, because I'm one of them, it's kind of a blend. It's like, okay, you want to, the guy's going to be a little bit better here, but a little worse here, or a little bit better here, you know. So, but Oliver's a guy that's going to line up um, and and just out athletic you. Um, maybe like uh, who's the guy that came out of Penn State last year that went to Miami, the volleyball player, Jacecki, uh, Mike Jacecki, Mike Jacecki, something like that. So I think that's a good one. And then who was the other guy you said again? Uh, this kid from uh, San Diego State. I think his first name is pronounced Kale. 
it's K H A L E Waring. Yeah, Waring. Yeah, I heard good yeah. things about. You know, I have I heard good things out of both. Um, and, and again, I, I'm on I'm on the CBS Sports side that says the top sleeper tight end in the class. So that says a lot. And again, there's so many sleeper guys. Tight ends are like the running backs, where you can almost get a guy on draft, and you can get a guy middle round, uh, like a Kittle, come in and just light the league up. Um, so no, I think tight end, running back, there are two positions where um, there's there's a premium for them, no doubt about it. But you can find these guys middle to late rounds that can make a real impact on the team. Guys, uh, any other tight end names you want to throw at Colin and get his uh, input? Yeah, I do. I have one more guy. I went with more of a blocker last time. This is more of a vertical guy. But Mac up in Notre Dame, Colin, do you have any oh, yeah. thoughts on him? I mean, I see some special athletic traits there that really I thought should have been used downfield a lot more in Notre Dame, and, and he really wasn't. And I think that he could be a guy – Maybe that they could get up here, like you said, you just never know when these injuries are going to creep up, and he could be a guy that could uh, make some plays downfield for Mitch. Yeah, I, 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 he looked like a guy that came on late there, and and I saw a bunch of articles on him, like everyone's sleeping on this guy, and again, it's that tight end position where there's a premium to top where you're like amazed by these three or four guys every year, and they all are usually really good and pan out, and then the rest of them is like, okay, which one can we find that can come in and play right away? And he's definitely a guy in Mac that can do that. Uh, and, and, you know, he came on a way. He's a hands catcher. I've seen some of his film. He, he, there's, there's no real weakness in his game. He's a solid player. He's an NFL tight end, a guy that will play on special teams, probably be like a third or fourth guy, and then work your way in. Uh, another guy I like, too, was a Sweeney out of Boston State. I mean, Boston College, excuse me, and then Helm out of Duke. Similar offenses. I, I covered both games. Temple played BC this year, and Temple played – Duke Helm had a bunch of catches in the bowl game, and Sweeney, I think, caught a touchdown or two against Temple. So there are another two guys that are kind of in that fold. Like I said, there's like a top four every year, and then, okay, who's left? Who can we find? Who's the diamond in the rough? And I think all the guys you named and a few of the guys I named, they're all part of that. And, again, we understand where the Bears are with their draft picks, where their salary gap is. So undrafted players, late-round picks, have a real shot to make the team. To stay with the uh, the tight end group that's currently rostered in Chicago, you know, um, obviously high round draft pick with Adam Shaheen. I I myself really saw him starting t- to make that next step. To me, he looked much more fluid until he got hurt, and obviously, I think it you know was a, a serious injury kept him out for a long time. But sometimes watching Adam, and, and this is maybe something that you could allude to coming from, you know, smaller college. Do you think that part of it, just the, the whole adjustment to the NFL was maybe even bigger than what he was expecting? And maybe, you know, just as long as he can get healthy year three, that maybe we can hopefully see him be what Ryan Pace thought he could be when he drafted him so high a couple of years ago. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, um, you know, Ashlyn Wright, D2, that's, that's, you're coming from a really small place. But it, to me, it's the person. It's what are you willing to do. And Adam's personality and his work ethic are what exactly it takes to be successful, whether you're from Ashland or Temple or Notre Dame, right, LSU. So yeah. it's really the person, not the school, I think. And he's a worker. He's a workaholic. He's always in the weight room. He's the first guy in every time you're there and the last guy to leave. Always doing the little things to get better, stronger. How can I make these things better? And, and that's why when I got, when he saw I got hurt, it's just a fluke thing, right? He just kind of was playing out the field and slipped on that grass in Denver, and all of a sudden, there you go. So unfortunate. Uh, he's not an injury-prone guy, even though he's had injuries. You know, it's a shame. I don't think he's that. He works so hard to keep his body right. But I think his role will really develop this year. You saw last year with the jump ball. You saw that ability. Uh, he's got great speed for a big man, the fastest big man I've ever seen, um, by far. I've never seen anybody move that big. I mean, that be that big, move that well. So, I think he's going to be killer this year on the jump ball touchdowns. Um, him and Mitch are going to have more opportunities to work on those things. Allen Robinson's a bigger receiver, but Adam Shaheen is a really big receiver. So on the goal line, put him out there against a the corner, against a the linebacker. 
if the, if the linebacker or corner play outside leverage, run a slam. If the, they play inside leverage, run a fade. So I think there'll be a couple touchdowns at Adam Jean in the back of the end zone in Soldier Field this year. And I think he'll have a nice year uh, and a bounce back healthy year for the uh, second round pick at Ashland. Colin, have you had a chance to see the, uh, uh, the Bears schedule that was released uh, a few hours ago? I did. I did. I did happen to see the home opener, too. Pretty, <laughs> Pretty nice, huh? And uh, you're still yeah. living in the Philadelphia area? Yeah. Okay, so what do you think about the Bears heading uh, to Philadelphia to play the Eagles? That's got to be the probably one of the hottest tickets out there, huh? Yeah, that has to be. I wouldn't be surprised if that game got pushed back at 1 o'clock on Fox. Uh, looks a little early for this game. But yeah, Joe Buck will be doing that game with uh, Troy Aikman for sure. I'd be shocked if not. Right, you got two of the biggest uh, markets, um, two story uh, football franchises, two teams that have been great in the recent past, and two teams that, uh, you know, if it wasn't for a missed kick, and to me it wasn't decided on the missed kick, but if it wasn't for that missed kick at the end of the game, you know, much different story to the NFL season last year. I think the Bears make a big run. And you know my opinion on that game. I thought the Bears were going to walk away with it. But uh, regardless, yes, there's a great schedule. Um, you can find the NFC East, so you got Dallas at home, you got the Giants at home, you go to Philly, uh, and then you go to you know you go to the Redskins. But, you, again, week two, you play Vic Fangio. <laughs> There'll be some cool ones with that. And then you play against the Raiders for a Coil Mack reunion there and then obviously we've got the Saints at home Chargers at home that's a good one to have at home not that the Chargers really have a crazy home field advantage but um, great schedule I think and you go to the Rams big game NBC and then you finish in Minnesota which seems like every year at this point but yeah. up there you get the, and then you get the Chiefs at the end of the year on right before Christmas so fun schedule uh, I'm sure Coach Nagy and and Ryan Pace will have the boys ready to go this year. Indeed. Hey, give us an update on your podcast. Yeah, so the this is a Sports Insider. We got it rolling. Uh, it's been fun. Again, the reason why I jumped into it is because I said there's a gap for the business side of sports. Everyone talks about the latest and greatest, but no one talks about contracts. No one talks about, you know, the NFL 401K policy or what's accredited season or what's the pension. Is there severance? I want to talk about that. We had a – you know, I'll have media members on talk about the business of sports media. Uh, have a little bit of everything. I've had NFL agents to athletic directors to financial advisors. Um, I'll have NFL scouts on this summer. So we're just doing a little unique take of that. Um, a few of us are working on at the business of sports insider. You can follow us, follow us on Twitter at uh, the business of SI and we're on Facebook as well. And we have a newsletter. So, it's been fun. Uh, honestly, I could have you guys on because you're a part of the business of sports itself, right? It's you, we got, you have the hottest podcast for one of the top teams in the NFL. That says something to say about it. And, um, you affect a lot of people, including myself. And, uh, it's a great thing you guys are doing. So I'm excited to be on and thanks for having me on again. I love being on your guys show. Thank you for the kind words and let uh, our audience know also how they can follow you personally on Twitter. Yeah, so uh, at Colin Thompson, TU, for Temple, for my owls, and hopefully some of my owls end up with the Bears this year. I think there's a couple guys, the Temple tough guys, that would fit in with Chicago. So at Colin Thompson, TU, and then at the business of SI. So thank you, guys. I really appreciate you again, and best of luck, and uh, go Bears. Thank you very much, Colin. We'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. Have a great night. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Colin. Well, fellas, man, man that's fun. How about it? Colin Thompson's I'm like the, great. I'm like the third smartest man in the bar room tonight, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely the dumbest. <laughs> That's without a doubt. <laughs> oh, all well, right. That's, that's, that's not a good... That's not a good insight there on, on those on those Temple guys. Yeah, I thought so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think Emery and, and Colin both really, I mean, hey... This is the the Bears are the perfect team for, us, especially with the way that this draft is unfolding for us this year. It's mm-hmm. not, you know, it's not about you know you turn on NFL Network or uh, Sirius XM Radio, and it's they're they're talking about the same ten fifteen guys. You know, you just you listen to this podcast when it comes out, you're getting guys that not a lot of people are talking about. Right. And you're getting in depth 
uh, you know, scouting reports on all of these guys just just on a whim. You give them a name and boom, they go. And there's not a lot of podcasts or shows in general out there that are giving you that. And we, and we did that tonight. Just a testament to Emery and to Colin Thompson about how knowledgeable they are. And we're really, really lucky to have them on with us. We really are. Fairlissimo is going to blow up my, my uh, Twitter <laughs> tomorrow with, with uh, Trevon Wesco raving review there <laughs> yes he will he, that is funny he loves he loves Wesco. I, I i don't know i i don't i don't see it but who, who knows well that's the beauty of this whole scouting business is that sometimes you get uh two very yeah. smart people they'll look at tape of the same player and come uh come away with with a 180 exactly. degree different opinions i'll um, tell you right now i would have never like i said just going back to tight ends i would have i was so pissed when Ryan Pace drafted Adam Shaheen where he did. I mean, I, I like the kid, but it's just I I was very, very upset. I'll just put it that way. And then like you said, you can, I I watched the kid. I saw some traits. Did I see second high second round traits? No, not at all. And it's it just goes to show you you never know. And this is a huge year for number eighty seven in Chicago. Yep. Yeah, and- exactly. I, just to touch on what you also mentioned, Shane, about these broadcast shows, the, the you know, I hate to yeah. throw these shows under the bus, but just, you know, show like the path to the draft. Yeah, they focus too much on the big names in the draft and not nearly enough on guys yeah. that they should be highlighting because, the you know, it, it – I think it would interest the audience more to get a report on Rock Yan Sin. Who totally agree. Who they've hardly uh, talked about, or Bruce Anderson, the running back from uh, what is it, the Northern uh, North North Dakota? North Dakota State. Dakota, yeah. Yeah, That's- guys like that that you know are are going to come into this league yeah. and make an imprint. Uh, you just know that they are, or that they're very likely to make an imprint. And these guys go unnoticed or hardly mentioned at all in some of these big shows. Everybody knows these top guys. And you look around the NFL and the the fabric of every single team. Look at Seattle the year that they won the Super Bowl. How many UDFAs they had on that team. Mm-hmm. You know, it's unbelievable. And like that is you're in Colin agreed with me, and I know you guys do too. That's gonna be a big, big part of the Bears offseason this year. After the draft, I mean, as soon as they're going to be talking to guys in the, in the fifth round and trying to secure them as, as UDFAs, and it is. There's, uh, It's really sad that you can't get more info on these guys just for the, you know, the people that aren't rabid fans like us. You know, Danny and I talk, and we're, you know, oh, I'm going to check this guy out tonight for the 15th time because maybe <laughs> I just didn't see something in his back pedal. Right. You know, and it is, it's, you get sick of seeing the, the the same whole guys over and over and over again, and it's I love having these guys on and talking about that. That's what impresses me so much with a guy like Emery Hunt. It's you can get you could get any publication or, or go to anywhere on the internet and just pick out a college player, and Emery Hunt is going to give you a synopsis <laughs> on the guy at the snap of a finger, and it's just so impressive. Yeah, it is, it is super impressive. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, yeah, with these still- big shows, though, like like Path of the Draft, it, what, unfortunately, it's it's a lot of agent driven. So, oh, yeah. a lot of these guys get their information from these agents, and and they kind of do them a favor, and they kind of pump up their guys. And a lot of times, you know, I, you're right. Although they, they they focus on these first round guys, but when when it's one of these second, third, fourth, fifth round guys that really become the you know heart and soul of a team in, in, in a lot of ways, if you look at it. Okay, um, so let's get to the rest of the tight ends that you guys have identified as your first, uh, your top five. And again, for those of you listening who have not listened to our previous shows, these are guys that Shane and Danny have targeted as mid-round draft uh, choices that will likely be there when the Bears are drafting. So we're talking about a, a third rounder, a fourth rounder, a fifth rounder, or later. These are guys that are not, you know, the top guys. These are these are guys that are, are mid round draft picks and guys that they've identified as guys that could potentially really help the Chicago Bears. So let's start. Uh, we we talked about Josh Oliver already with Colin Thompson. Let's start with Dax Raymond. Danny, tell me why you like Dax. 
Well, Dex is a guy that uh, prior to the Senior Bowl, I really had not, to be honest with you, heard of him. And then when I saw his name added to the group of tight ends that, that were going to be down in Mobile, I started looking at his tape before it got down to Alabama. And what really stood out with me with him is he's, he's got the tall frame, you know, 6'5", 255 pounds. He really is an easy mover with, with good foot quickness. Um, he's a second-level blocker, meaning that, you know, when he, when he chips and he gets out to the second level, the linebackers and, and the safeties and corners and whatnot, he's tenacious. You know, he looks for work, you know, and when he locks into a guy, he keeps his legs churning. So he really eliminates the guy out of the play. And then what I call he finishes, finishes his block. So uh, he's a natural soft hands catcher, uh, big hands, although you and I saw him make some nice grabs down at, uh, in Mobile uh, during the, the senior bowl practices. Mm-hmm. Um and he's, he's good uh, with yards after the catch. Uh, I mean, he, he's quick to catch and turn up field. He doesn't waste any time. There's no motion or anything like that. Catches it, and he's, he's quickly up field. Uh, he's versatile. He lines up in the slot. He lines up as, a, as an H-back. He can line up as an inline blocker as well. And the one thing I like about him is he's a tough, tough competitor. Uh, and he's clutch, too. 19 of his 27 receptions went for first downs. So that's a guy that the quarterback trusted and went to uh, and a crucial play to to go and convert and move the chain. So, you know, things like that is, is what I like about, about Raymond. Excellent. Uh, Shane, what have you seen out of Dax Raymond? Uh, do you agree with uh, Danny's uh, assessment? I do. He's a, he's a kid that wasn't on my five, but he is a kid that I'm very intrigued by. And Danny, I see when I see him, I think the way that he is going to transition to the NFL, the way that these – NFL offenses are going. I think that he's a kid that's going to be a better pro than he was a collegian. Is that? Do you agree with that? Yeah, the, the, he's still growing. He's still developing. Yeah. Uh, he took two years off to serve a church mission to Russia, so uh, before he attended college. So he, he's still a guy. He's going to be a 24 year old rookie, but yet he's still a guy that's developing. And what do you like about him? Is and you're right, Shane. I see him more as a as a move tight end, a guy that kind of flex yeah. out slot. And, and eventually, uh, I think he's got the ability, he's got the frame to add on some weight, to get stronger. And then also, I think he's got the will and the want to to be a blocker. So that's important because a lot of these kids don't want to block. They just want to go out there, run r- routes, catch, you know, catch touchdowns, and that's it. But if you take a look at Raymond, when, when he blocks, he gives an effort and, and he tries. Yeah. It just he doesn't have the size and he's not yet in terms of play strength there yet. You know, but you, know, you bulk him up, you get him, you know, we've talked about this on previous shows you get these kids on your in your system in your programs you you give them the nutrition you get them stronger and you know the want to is there with him and i i think he will be uh or, or he could be a serviceable inline blocker but you're right initially his his money maker is going to be his hands and his ability yeah. to run routes and, and catch passes out of the slot primarily yeah and you see you see the bears you and naggy you see you know how they like to use that tight end screen I have written down here versus Air Force. I don't know if that was a tape that you watched of him. He took a screen pass in that game, and I'm like, wow, this you know, that's kind of really what stood out to me most with him, just kind of being really, really surprised. I wouldn't say that he's got um, elite top-end speed for a tight end, but he's got more than enough to right. uh, to make a play like that. And um, like I said, I think he's just – going to be a guy that grows in the NFL and he, you put him in a place like Chicago where he doesn't really need to come in and play a ton of snaps. He's a guy that can kind of learn, but then he's also a guy that you can bring in in the third quarter that's fresh and he can pop one off and, you know, totally change uh, the direction of a game by making one play, like you said. So, yeah, he's definitely an interesting guy to me. All right, let's move on. I think both of you guys had Caden Smith on your list. Uh, Shane, share with us what you like about Caden. I, I didn't. That was oh, Danny's okay. guy. Ah, yep. all right, Danny, tell us what you like about Caden, and then we'll get the, uh, Shane's uh, f- fighting words with you about Caden Smith. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, Caden Smith, tight end, Stanford, right there. My ears perk up. You know, Stanford is is being known now, you know, the last couple of seasons as, you know, tight end you, you know, they've been producing some very solid prospects at the position, um, you know, in, in the NFL. So it, this is a kid that, that kind of, to me, I, I'd heard about, but I hadn't really delved into his tape until recently. And, uh, you know, first of all, going back to his background, he's a five-star high school recruit out of Texas. 
and uh, did not play in 2016. He's only a junior, so he still had a year of eligibility uh, remaining. Um, what really has hurt him, and I think what teams or why you're not hearing his name a lot, he ran a 4.9240 at the combine, and I think that really surprised a lot of a lot of teams, a lot of scouts, and because on tape he looks like a mid 4.7 guy, if, if I get to guess. Um, another thing about him is is he still. You know, he's a willing blocker. He, he's an inline wide blocker. Uh, so he'll be able to you know, line up and, and play both, you know, as a um, and, and tight end at the end of the uh, line of scrimmage and also line up in the slot. And also he was also flexed out a lot at Stanford as well. So but he is and his one, you know, one year as a starter this past season, 2018, he was named an all pack 12 second team. He had 70 receptions for his two year career at Stanford, 70 receptions, over a thousand yards, seven touchdowns and average 15 yards a catch. Um, he's another kid that's got the solid frame, 6'5", 255 pounds. Uh, and he also has room to grow to add some more muscle. Uh, I like his lateral agility. He can slide and shuffle his feet in, in, both as a run blocker and also in pass pro. Um, he can sustain, in my opinion, he can sustain at the line of scrimmage as an inline blocker. Um, he's a scrappy competitor. You know, he understands leverages, positioning, and he's consistently blocking his man. You know, and this is another guy that will finish his blocks. And you guys know, having spoken to me, you know, in previous uh, shows about blockers, you know, whether it's offensive linemen or tight ends. If a guy finishes, that's, that's you know, you got a star in my book right there. I love guys who finish their blocks. Um, and in, in terms of, in terms of you know, uh, as a pass catcher, this guy uh, will go out and he'll extend away from his body and he can contour his body and adjust to the ball and make catches. This guy will make a living in the middle of the field, in my opinion. He reminds me a little bit, and this might be high praise, but to me, he reminds me a lot of Jason Witten. The, the former Cowboys, or actually current Cowboys tight end as well. Uh, but uh, he's a guy that will make a living in the middle of the field. Uh, his ability to, to go up in traffic, he, he's, he's not scared. He'll, you know, lay out or whatnot and make um, uh, catches over defenders and uh, also uh, does a good job of catching through contact. Now, one of the reasons why he does that is because he doesn't create much separation downfield. So those are one of the negatives on him. But uh, in terms of a guy that can come in, and I think produce right away, you know, both as an inline blocker, as a guy that you line up in the slot, and as a pass catcher, uh, this is a guy that I really do like a lot. Now, the only thing you got to question is his 492 speed. Is that what he, you know, that's, like I said, that's not what I think he plays at. I think he plays more in a 4-7 range, you know, it, so the Bears are going to have to kind of say, all right, is this really, is he really a 492 guy? And can we live with his lack of, you know, un, unable to stretch a seam or, or be a, a deep, deep threat? All right, Shane, we're in the draft room. Uh, we've got to decide on our board. Danny's made his case for this tight end. Why don't you like him as much as Danny? The biggest thing that concerns me, and Danny already talked about it, the lack of separation, and I think that that's what's contributed to his ball skills that are as good as they are, Danny, you'll probably agree, because of the lack of separation. And that's where it's a red flag for me is if you have a lack of separation in college, that's only going to get that much worse at the next level. Is that something that can be a pr improved? Probably, like you said, you see a guy like Jason Witten, like you mentioned, that's not going to exactly you know pull away from anybody. But that's just something that I, I have marked down here uh, that does concern me going to the next level. I don't see the explosion that I want to see. Uh, especially when he's coming off the line. But I think probably just with experience moving forward, that's something that can be uh, developed, you know, when he gets used to the, the uh, NFL offseason program, getting in the weight room to work out of his, his uh, you know, point of attack uh, strength, stuff like that. But um, separation, is it's just something that definitely just, I don't want to say it's a, a huge concern, but it's uh it's an issue for me because if it's an issue in college, it's going to be a big issue in, in the NFL. Danny, you want to read? Yeah, that's exactly. I know he's, he's right. He does not create much separation on field. However, there are plays where you do see him, um, you know, and when he gets out in his route, he, he, he's got this slick move where he, he kind of uh, breaks to the outside, gets the defender to turn his hips outside, and then he cuts across his face and, and gets, you know, a huge window or, or provides a huge window, a throwing window for the quarterback. So there are a couple of times where he does do that. It's just a matter of, I guess, you know, per, you know, getting better with his route running, being able to sell those type of routes on a consistent basis. But yes, you're right, Shane. You know, he doesn't 
create that big gap or the big separation. And that's primarily why he is so much good at catching through contact and yeah. being able to go up over guys and, and bring a ball in. I mean, he made some catches in between two or three guys, defenders right there. Yeah. And you, just to show you how strong his, his hands are, he goes up there and just snags the ball in between two defenders. And, you know, I was like, the table's watching, like, wait, he caught that? I have to rewind it like three, four times, make sure he caught the, the ball. But yeah, I mean, he does those kind of plays. Yeah, a lot of it. He's got, speaking of Stan, he's got a lot of Zach Ertz in him that way. You know, Zach Ertz is so good. He's going to make, like you said, make it a living in the middle of the field. He's not a guy that's going to create all that huge separation. But if the ball is near him, he's going to catch it. And if there's three guys on him, he's going to catch it. So that's what you want him to shoot for. I just, uh, I think he's going to be a guy that's, I think he's going to take a little bit more time to uh, get where you want to, where you want him to be as a tight end. And I mean, we're talking about that here in Chicago with uh, Adam Shaheen, same, same type of deal. You can have these overall traits that you love, but there's some of them that are just holding you back to uh, take that next step. Well, the one guy I know you guys are not going to argue about is Jay Sternberger, the, the kid out of Texas A&M, a, a vertical passing threat uh, immediately. Uh, but there are some questions about him. Uh, Shane, why don't you begin with your assessment on Jace? Well, this is a guy that I actually, uh, I don't know how Danny feels here, that I almost kept him off my list because I honestly don't feel like he's going to be there. Even at 87, I'm just, he's going to be a guy I think somebody's going to fall in love with. You know, he, he, the thing that I like about him, Danny, he's got, he's got the hands, but he knows how to find those soft spots in the zone. And that's to bring up Zach Ertz name again. That's when I watch Ertz. That's what I see so much of. He's just so he's elite at that. He'll be going. He just boom. He, he, he makes that cut, finds that soft spot in the zone he may not break off a long run after that, but he's he's consistently eating up the yardage, and that's just something that I really really love. I uh, friend of the show Matt Carson's and cars we're talking about. He's a huge Sternberger fan, and Danny, do you think come draft day that he's going to be there at eighty seven? Because oof, I I just I don't think he's going to be. That's going to be tough because. I mean, he's the one guy of the list that I have, and, and probably I'm, I'm not sure about your list, but this is the one guy that I would consider drafting at 87. Oh, yeah, right? you have to. Yeah, yeah. no, I totally the other agree. Guys are, the other guys are that we're not talking about are more guys in the fourth, fifth round. Yeah. You know, but this is the guy, the one guy that I would consider drafting at 87. And because, like you said, he is he's a weapon, basically. He, he will not block. That, this, is, this guy is, is a move tight end. He's a guy you flank out at, at the slot. Or you put him as, as a receiver. He basically, he's a, he's a bulked up receiver. I yeah, mean, he's he a good be, athlete. He can beat you with speed. He's the guy right. that can beat you with his speed, for right. sure. This guy is a seam stretcher. He's got that straight line speed. Like you said earlier, he's got you know, he's a very good natural hands catcher. Uh, he's quick off the line of scrimmage, quick into his routes. He runs clean routes. And, and like I said, he looks like a right receiver. Uh, his ability with yards after contact is, is pretty, pretty good. I mean, he, his contact balance, he bounces off defenders. Um, and like you said, he's a zone buster. He knows how to find the, the holes and the openings in the zone. And he gives the, the, the quarterback a nice target to throw at. He's 6'4", 251 pounds. Um, so, yeah, this is a guy that I think, you know, and, and, and when you watch him and you watch him separate at the second level from linebackers, again, crisp routes. He able, he's able to set up the defender and then just break open. And this guy will create the, uh, the, the window that we were talking about earlier with Caden Smith not being able to do that. Uh, but, you know, and also he, he's tough. You know, he's a tough-minded guy. This guy also will go over the middle, make tough catches. Um, but, again, he is strictly a stretch or move tight end. Yeah. He's not going to block. And, and you know, if you try to put him at the line of scrimmage, he will get engulfed. He will get bullied. So, yeah. you know, now, to his credit, he does try. You know, there was a couple times uh, Jimbo Fisher lined him up at, uh, at the end line as, as a Y. And, I mean, he gave it an effort. I mean, it yeah. wasn't very good, but he gave it an effort. So you know who uh, else used to be like that in college? Greg Olson. Greg Olson. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Same thing. And exactly. you know something that I've noticed about him too, Danny, and I should have touched on it before, is you know you're talking about him. You know the toughness factor. 
I don't know if I've seen another tight end that absorbs the contact so good and keeps going. And that's a huge Sternberger. part. Yeah. That's a yeah, huge and the way and he bounces off of contact. Yes, that's what's even then just gobbles up he gobbles that's hidden yardage. And all of that adds right. up at the end at the end of the game. And that's something that's that right. can't be undersold. One thing that I'll ask you, Aldo, Bears go out at eighty seven and draft Sternberger. Who's that sending more of a message to? Well in the tight cl- end room. Clearly uh, Trey Burton, in my mind. Uh, yeah. I think that because they've invested a second rounder in Shaheen and because he's had legitimate excuses of injuries slowing his development, I think that the message is more for Trey Burton. Uh, they, they would play a similar position, that pass-catching joker type tight end. So the message is sent, Trey, if, if you don't uh, – you know, we've we've got an out on your contract after the 2019 season, if I recall correctly. So if if you don't deliver, you know, you uh, you, you're on the block here of uh, being moved out. Is is that the answer you think that I was gonna say? Well, yeah, because I think that there's still a lot of rumors out there and and people that are concerned about what transpired with Trey Burton. Mm-hmm. My biggest thing there, and I don't know how you guys feel about this. I think if there was any question in the Chicago's, Chicago Bears' minds at all that he wasn't really injured, I think that they would know. Yes. And I think that they would just eat the fucking money and move off the guy totally, for sitting out totally a, a playoff game. So that's that's I guess that's my silver lining that he must have been legitimately hurt. Because I, I, somebody had said that he may – you know, he may not have even been able to go against L.A. Right. So, you know, Trey Burton's got exact. I, honestly, I think he was probably their top tar. I'll even put him as their top target over Allen Robinson in free agency. Mm-hmm. Just how important this position is in Matt Nagy's offense. I think he was probably, all right, We this uh, we're going after him, and then we're going to fill in from there. You know, there was – rumors of Sammy Watkins and maybe they would have settled for Sammy Watkins if Allen Robinson didn't want to come there. But who, who knows? Sternberger is that guy. Mm -hmm. And I do agree with you and you can't have enough of those guys, especially in this offense. And it's a a tight end is going to be Mitch's best friend. And you talk, this is something to keep in mind, Danny, you can chime in on this too. We lost to the Philadelphia Eagles in the playoffs and you talk about the, the, the correlation with Philly and Chicago with uh, Peterson and Nagy and Andy Reid is the same type of thing. Philadelphia had Trey Burton, obviously, to let him go to Chicago. Philly still had Zach Ertz. What did they do last year? They turned right around and they traded up ahead of Dallas for Dallas Goddard. Mm-hmm. That kid's mm-hmm. going to blow up this year. You yep. just wait and see. It's you true. just wait and see. And this is where a guy like Sternberger, don't count this out if he's there. I'm, I, you know, I have other positions and players that I'd like better, but don't count it out. I'm telling you, don't count it out. And then the one thing about Sternberger, and I'll touch base on, on Burn real quickly here as well, but Sternberger, the way they use them at Texas A&M, mm-hmm. the, the slip screens, you know, they, they line up as in the backfield and then they'll, they'll throw a screen to him. Um, the, the way the the real quick outs in the flat, it it, re- it was really reminiscent of the way KC uses Travis Kelsey, and of course Nagy came from that offense. So I, when I saw his tape, that's the first person I thought of is is being used or utilized in the way Kansas City uses Travis Kelsey. So uh, that's what Sternberger. And, and in terms of Burn, going back to if he if he did sit out a game because he wasn't really hurt, I think more so the locker room would have yeah. something to say about that. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So if, if, the, if his teammates... Oh, they'd know, yeah, for yes, sure. Yes, his teammates would know. And if that's the case, once... If you bail on your teammates, especially during a, a playoff game, you're done. <laughs> so the fact that he's back and he's, you know, he's here... And, and so I, I'm, I'm thinking that it was a legitimate injury. Yeah, and let's be honest. The Bears aren't scared to eat money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're doing it at the kicking position. Cody Parker. You know, yeah, they've, they've done it before. And that's, right. you know, there, there's... I know there's, and I understand it. It was a huge issue. I mean, it 
affected the outcome. Let's be honest. Very true. Malcolm Jenkins focused on him all week long, and mm-hmm. then he's gone, and he turned his attention to Tariq Cohen. What would Tariq do other than the return? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, so, it's a, you know, it's an issue. There's no doubt about it. And and if it is anxiety related, having some experience with that, sometimes you can develop an injury or a pain, and it's not diagnosed by doctors because it's a psychologically induced pain. So they'll take MRIs, they'll take X-rays, and they'll say, "There's nothing wrong with you, kid." And you know, they kind of point at your head and say, "You know, it's all in here." And maybe that's what he went through. And that, for an NFL team, is perhaps the most difficult thing to deal with because what do you do? I mean, you can send them to a shrink to get some help and stuff, but it could happen again if, if the guy doesn't take uh, the next necessary talk therapy or, or medication to help him deal with that issue. Now, he is denied that it, this was anxiety-related, but sometimes you can deny it and, and be wrong. Um, so it's a very difficult position that Trey Burton is in and the Chicago Bears are in. There's no doubt about it. Would you be surprised if a team like Green Bay, if they didn't take one of the tight ends early, made a move on Sternberger at 30? Mm-hmm. Would it totally shock you? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, like they, I've seen mock drafts right now with Noah Fant going to Green Bay at 30. Yeah. You know, um, I've seen mock drafts where they take a receiver. You know, at, at 30, but they're definitely it, these these tight ends. Like like Colin was saying, there are two types of tight ends. There there are there are ones that can catch and and, and block, and there's one that can just catch. Yeah. And a, a majority of these tight ends that are coming out nowadays are the move slash you know catch tight ends, kind of like Sternberger and Dax Raymond and, and so on and so forth. So um, that's why I, I thought the Bears going into this off season. The fact that they only had, well, 200 contract until they re-signed Broniker, now only only have three. I think not only could they draft one, they might sign one as an undrafted free agent. They might even go get a veteran to come in and, and fill sure. in you know, or just to play as well. Because remember, they carried five tight ends last season. Yeah. And uh, if, if, you, if you get a guy like Sternberger, for example, a move tight end, a guy who cannot block, you still need to get a blocker. Now, are you going to go get a, a UDFA? Uh, a college, you know, an undrafted free agent, or are you going to go get an actual NFL um, veteran blocking tight end free agent? You know, so I think I think the, there are more moves to be made at the tight end position that than we all realize. Yep, and I would just if if Mike North was on here, I I, I wouldn't bet two jelly beans that he's going to be there <laughs> at 80, 87. I I just don't I just don't see it happening. I'll be. You know, we talk about running. I, I think there's more of a chance of Miles Sanders being at 87 than there is of Sternberger, myself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Very interesting. And so we'll see how that materializes. Now we've got to talk about a guy who Danny has uh, mentioned way too often in my ear, especially when we're down at the senior votes, Drew Sample from Washington. Yeah. Still in love with Sam- him, huh? <laughs> yeah. Sample is another guy that, that when I saw his name uh, as part of the um, tight end group over at the Senior Bowl, I started looking at his tape and I'm like, man, why isn't this guy utilized more? I mean, if you take a look at prior to this season, you know, he, the most catches he had in a in season was nine back in 2016. And this past season he had 25 receptions for 252 yards. But if you look at him, I mean, he looks like just like a natural hands catcher. Uh, a guy that at the senior bowl, when I was watching him, every pass thrown his way, he didn't drop anything. And I, that's the guy that, uh, although I kept telling him, like, look, Sample hasn't dropped a pass yet. And, um, and, in, and in terms of inline blocking, this is a guy that I feel very, very confident that if he ends up on the Bears roster, at worst case scenario, he's your fourth tight end next season. And he's a guy that, you know, week one versus Green Bay, you can line him up uh, confidently in a, in a two tight end set and, you know, and know that he will not be out there and killing your quarterback. So uh, Drew Sample is a guy that's not getting a lot of love, not a lot of pub, um, mainly because I think he's been kind of uh, written off as a just a blocking tight end. But I'm telling you, this guy has has the size at 6'5", 255 pounds. He ran a 4'7", 140. Um, he's got the, the length in terms of arm length at 30, almost 34 inches. So, you know, he, he also present a nice target in the red zone. Um, but again, he's, he's an inline blocker. And a guy who who looks who I think it was underutilized 
and uh, who could be a better pro uh, in terms of as a pass catcher in the NFL. All right. Danny, correct me if I'm uh, – I'm sorry, Shane. Do you want to remark on Sample at all? No, no I just – some of the things that I had written down with him, you know, you, you saw the Bears, how they, you know, once they finally moved off of Mike Burton at fullback, I think some of his best attributes was when, did you notice when they used him as a lead blocker, Danny? Sample, yeah. Yeah, at, at Washington. I thought yep. he was very effective. I thought he was very effective there. And, you know, you talk about the, it's, you know, when I talked about Foster Moreau, same type of deal. Uh, in the offense, <laughs> they, they were Washington was passing all of their all of their passes to their running back. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now. Miles Gaskin. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the guys like that. And then didn't they have a, not one more? Another Maybe RB. He's not, can't. Anyways, I don't know. I'm blanking on it. But yeah, he's just a. I, he's a guy that didn't make my list. But I think there's so many. Um, Colin alluded to it. There's so many guys, and Danny, you did too. It's 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 not a lot of you know guys with their magic bag of tricks. It's they're doing one thing or they're doing another. There's not a lot of both, and that's what makes guys like Sternberger so so valuable because the way that the the NFL is moving now is it's you know pass 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 and tight ends getting matched up on linebackers and and safeties and making plays downfield so you know he's a guy like you said i think fourth tight end bringing him in here uh would definitely have a future you can't he can't be any worse than Deion sims was you know you know they brought him in <laughs> no. here, and i think he offers you a lot more upside in the passing game but uh he's he's a nice player i just he i just didn't have him on my list Right. And again, this guy, this is a guy that, that I'm, I'm thinking about maybe in the seventh, you know, maybe in, the, in I know they don't have a sixth round pick, but someone late in the draft uh, that you can you can put on your roster and, and the guy who can contribute right away. Um, you know, the, the fact that we were talking earlier about uh, Sternberger being a, a zone buster, you know, watching Drew Sample, he does a really nice job of finding holes in the zone as well. And he just sits there, he just sits there and he gives, uh, he squares his shoulder back up to the quarterback, gives him a nice big target to throw at. And like I said earlier, he's a he's a hands catcher. Um, didn't see him drop any passes at, at the Senior Bowl, but you know, uh, again, he just looks like a natural, smooth pass pass catcher and a guy I believe similar to your to your kid Moreau from uh, from LSU. I, I think he was underutilized as well, and I think those two guys, when uh, put in a right system and, and utilized with a with an efficient NFL quarterback, I think those guys are going to surprise a lot of people. One of the things that Dane Brugler wrote in his draft guide for the Atlantic dot com is that uh, he does a really good job sample does of working with the scrambling quarterback uh, getting open and there's a good communication there which would make him kind of an, an ideal candidate for uh, uh, Mitch Trubisky who has to create so many plays on the run uh, that's something to look at another thing that is uh, interesting to note about sample is that he's a very very mature uh, football player his his coach said that every single day he is the model of what it should look like this guy is just a a, a professional he was a professional a, a, as a college football player in terms of how he handled his responsibilities and so forth but the one knock according to Brugler is that he just sometimes um, doesn't do much after the catch he, he just doesn't have right. that elusiveness to uh, create yak yards after the catch but uh, he's a very intriguing athlete, and I'll tell you what, uh, Danny loves this guy so much that if he does come to the Chicago Bears, we're going to have to get these two guys together on a date night. Well, I, I don't know if, if it's between him or Josh Oliver. I, I know Colin kind of poo-pooed my Josh Oliver guy. <laughs> he did. <laughs> well, talking about your guys, here's uh, your list, if I got this right. Dax Raymond, Drew Sample, Caden Smith, Cahale Waring, and uh, Josh Oliver, is that and Jay Jay Sternberger as well? And Jay Sternberger. Okay, so those are the guys you had on your list. Now, Shane, we've talked about Foster Moreau uh, with uh, Colin. We talked about uh, Elise Mack from Notre Dame. Uh, Josh Oliver. We've talked about Jay Sternberger. So that leaves us with Dawson Knox. Tell us why you like him. He's a big, you know, strong country boy kid. He guy that kind of came on late, really. To me, it, 
didn't know a, a heck of a lot about him, but it's another upside guy. You know, I don't think he's super athletic, you know, have some issues maybe with it, with him at the top of his stem, but um, just a, a guy that I like. When you're talking down where we are, again, it's, you know, I, I hate to bring up that he didn't look very good against Alabama because not very many teams – or not very many players did. He he had a tough one against Alabama. He looked really good against Kentucky this year. But um, Danny hit it on the head just talking about how these guys, you know, it's one or another. But Dawson Knox, I think, is a guy that, that's going to give you the ability to maybe do a little bit of both moving forward. I think it's just going to take him him some time. And I think that he can make you make some plays. Uh Decent hands. I've seen him make some nice, you know, the hand catches there, and I'd like to see that. Uh, would like to see him have a little bit better catch radius in in games. I think he's kind of folded up a little bit and and not taking advantage of his size against smaller defenders. So that that has been an issue, Danny. I'm not sure how you feel about Dawson Knox. But uh, Dawson Knox is a guy that's getting a lot of a lot of hub and a lot of pub, and I just. I don't see it, man, because I, I, I watch his yeah. tape. First of all, the guy has had zero touchdowns for his career. Yeah. Okay, he has not had a kind of touchdown. He's a former um, high school quarterback who, who played wide receiver as, as a junior in, in high school, a three-year letterman in track and field, uh, and a former high school dunk champion. So the guy's a tremendous athlete, and you see that on tape. You see the explosiveness out of his stance. You see him when he's running his routes. You see him when he's cutting. But the, the couple of games I saw, he dropped too many passes for me. Now – Granted, he didn't get that many ball storm. I think he only had what eighteen or nineteen yeah, they receptions didn't, they, for the season. They didn't use him very much. That's that's for sure. You know, when yeah. I look at him back in the day, I think it would have been nineteen ninth draft of ninety seven when the Bears drafted John Allred. Mm-hmm. He was a guy that I don't ever think was a great prospect overall. He just he's a tools guy. I think he's got everything you want to work with. He's just right. another guy that's going to take some time. And I just think that he's another guy like Moreau that we talked about that just wasn't – he wasn't really asked to do anything. You know, they didn't just use him much. And then, like I said, the way that this game is going in the NFL, you want to see these guys that you may get later. What you want to see is you want to see them have the tools. The traits, these, you know, right. Yeah, they're going to have these traits – you know, a piece of clay, and you're going to mold him moving forward. And and I do see that in Knox. I see the the things that I want to see if you're going to be a later pick like that, that you can move forward with. And, you know, he could be a guy that they look at like, um, I don't think he's as explosive as Broniker, but, you know, another guy with these guys uh, rostering so many tight ends, I think that they're going to want a guy like Knox with traits that they can maybe, you know, exploit some um, – situations in the NFL with him yeah I just think he's so far um he, he needs so much more development that I, I think he he wouldn't be able to help them next season in my opinion I, I think I, I think he's a better athlete than Broniker just from just looking at his tape but in, in, in terms of just as a pass catcher uh like I said some his hands to me were very consistent um and yeah he averaged about 18 19 yards a catch but like you said he only had like you know, right. 17 or 18 receptions for the entire season. And it, there's times where he's not even asked to run a route. I mean, he really just yeah. you know, goes out and stands in the flat. Nothing, which, yeah. yeah and, it, and I know they have the NWO, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, nasty whiteouts, uh, like mm-hmm. the, they can call themselves out there. But uh, it's just something that if, if you were a tight end prospect that I'm going to draft, you at least have a career touchdown, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you'd think, especially in college, you'd think that you're just going to fall into one at some right. point. Absolutely. But it just, you know, for whatever reason, they just didn't. And maybe is it a mental thing? I'm, I'm not sure, but they just didn't. Like you said, there's some plays you just literally see him standing in the flat doing nothing. And for whatever reason, and that's like I said, that's when it comes down to traits. And he's a guy that. You, you just never know if you if you hit on him, he can he can pay off for you. But I think you're right; it's going to take some time with him to 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 put everything together. I just think he's he does have the traits that I like to see, and maybe he can make a couple of plays for you along the way. 
Yeah, physical traits, he, he no doubt he has that. Uh, I, I just seen his name like in the second round and third round. I just Oof, yeah, I don't, I, I don't see, see that. that. For me, that's no. too rich. Yep, I agree there. Well, it's funny that you say that because Dane Brugler over at the Athletic has him as a, as the 85th overall prospect on his board. Oh. So he he has he has a lot of optimism about him. Here's what he writes: Overall, knock. Knox is a fascinating prospect because his athletic traits and infrequent flashes on tape suggest he has NFL starting upside, projecting best in a zone scheme. But is he a sleeping giant or a better athlete than football player? And I think that's essentially what you guys have have been uh, hitting on. But yeah, uh, apparently Brugler and a bunch of other assessors of talent for the media think that this guy could go in the second or third round. So yeah. pretty amazing. And, and one, one thing just to go back to Broniker, Danny, I don't know if, the, if you heard the show when we had Colin Thompson on talking about him, he called Ben Broniker one of the very best athletes on the entire yep. roster yep. in Chicago. Yep. And he goes, when I say that, he goes, I'm talking to everybody on the roster. He's like the kid. He goes, I've never, I mean, he was extremely complimentary of him. Hmm. And he also yep. called him one of the fastest players on the roster. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, I, I was shocked by when Colin said yeah. that. I was really shocked. The fastest player on the roster, considering you have guys like Tariq Cohen and, yeah. and Taylor Gabriel, yep. that's, that's a little bit out there for me. Well, yep. you know these tight ends, they all stick together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, uh, I think we've covered everyone on your list. And so yeah. how I want to uh, end the show was with Berlissimo's uh, assessment of Ryan Pace's draft. Unfortunately, uh, Ryan Pace's uh, draft 2016, to 2017, 2018. Unfortunately, because of the technical problems that I'm experiencing tonight, I can't play that back for you guys for you guys to listen to. So... What we're going to do is pretend that we heard it. <laughs> oh, Barely Samo, you're so full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that, and I know uh, Danny echoes that sentiment. <laughs> you think Tyo Fabaluge is Orlando Pace? <laughs> what? Barely Samo? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm just waiting for the, uh, the Trayvon Wesco uh, <laughs> yeah. DMs tomorrow morning. Yeah, Trayvon Wesco is uh, going to be a, a star in, <laughs> in Berlissimo's eyes after he heard Colin's assessment. All right, let's get to uh, Berlissimo's role in here. Uh, he does a really cool thing where he talks about all the players that Pace has drafted from 2016, 17, and 18 and assigns them a category stud, could, or dud, and he will explain that. Roll it. <laughs> Good evening, draft on tappers, bar flyers, bear fans, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. After last week, I reviewed the 2015 draft and I gave you uh, my appraisal on each pick. Bearing in mind, Ryan Pace didn't even have his own staff then, at least in terms of his collegiate staff. But now, obviously, between the years 2016 to 18, inclusively that's three years, um, he's had his own staff and he's been able to pick and choose based on his own grading systems the players that he likes. So based on that, I thought I'd uh, just go through with you on all of the picks and give a stud, could, or dud scoring system. And you can either agree with me or you can debate me at Bellissimo. Stud means to extend or their great value wherever they are picked. Could, worth keeping on a squad until we can get something better. Dud, duh, no longer on the team for several reasons. So without further ado, let's look at 2016. We had the first pick, Leonard Floyd from Georgia and whilst he had defensive scores in each of his first three years in the league um, his sack production has dropped from seven in year one I believe to for both of the last two seasons and he's he started the year slow last year with some lingering effects of injury uh, with the hand but also potentially his concussion but he did significantly improve after being slated by draft Dr Phil amongst others in the second half of the year and he seems to save his best game for the Packers every year so for that reason he gets a cud. Round 2, Cody Whitehead, guard, 
centre tackle out of Kansas State. Joined as a left tackle, he's simply a must extend in my view. He's most most consistent starter on the, on the offensive line, both at guard and centre, and he looks to be returning back to guard this year. So he's a stud and is one that we need to certainly extend. Round three, Jonathan Bullard, defensive end from Florida. Bullard to me coming out was a three tech who's too small or weak to play. No, certainly not an Eddie Goldman in our scheme. And he doesn't seem to be long enough or or strong enough to be able to play defensive end. And his role is diminished every single year, so he's a possible cut for me from his rookie deal. Dud. Round four, Nick Kwiatkowski, a linebacker from West Virginia. He had one of the best hits as a blitzer that I've ever seen in the NFL, which was the hit versus Lael Collins, where he absolutely just stunned him and knocked him not only backwards, but onto his ass. He's a good goal line linebacker when it's obvious against the run, but don't ask him to cover in man or zone or we'll see him getting crisscrossed up. But he could likely also be replaced by Joel E. Bunio, Bunio, who we'll come on to later. Round four, we had Dion Bush from Miami, and he's never really been pressed to start, but he has had a high play count uh, increased. It's increased year on year. And when he was pressed into duty last year following Jackson's injury, he showed that he could, and he's still with the team, so he's a could. Round four, DeAndre Hall, the second pick in round four. He started off as a cornerback from Northern Iowa, but then transitioned to safety. And he did okay as corner before being moved to safety and then getting lost in the depth chart and uh, the transition in that move. But despite that, Pace was able to salvage something, getting a seventh round pick from the Eagles. But he was picked at 126 overall. So whilst it started with promise, he's turned into a dud. Round 5, I think the guy we all know, Jordan Howard, running back from Indiana. He was great value for the Bears when he was drafted. He provided the most offence that the Bears had prior to him and Nagy's arrival. Um, but we have to look objectively, I think, and his, his yards per game have declined, his yards per carry have declined, and in, t- in terms of his, his t- carry amount, that's been fairly similar each year. So... He is on the decline. He was a stud, but he now joins DeAndre Hall on the team that put us out of the players, playoffs last year on the Philadelphia Eagles. But so now he's a cud. Round six, DeAndre Houston Carson. Safety, William & Mary, special teamer throughout. He hasn't really been, out, been able to show much of anything else other than just being a special teamer. And he's been brought back in a restricted free agent tender, so that's something. He's a cud. Round 7, Daniel Braverman, Western Michigan wide receiver, winner of the Brock Fawcy, great white heart, training camp award, disappeared when given limited opportunity and is out of the league. He's a nice guy, sadly finished last, dud. Undrafted free agents that we're still dating from that class is Ben Bronica, everyone needs a Bronica, and Roy Robertson Harris, who has really improved year on year and might excel if given the opportunity to be a bully on the edge, but certainly he's got the strength and the length to play defensive end, and he's got the suddenness, I believe, to be able to play edge as well for us. On to 2017. Mitchell David Trubisky, quarterback North Carolina. There's nothing that I can say that other analysts on Bears Bar Room haven't already said about Mitch or have put on the Tape Never Lie series. He's a stud. Round 2, Adam Shaheen, tight end Ashland. He's looked great in training camp, he's looked good in isolated plays, but his injuries are starting to become a worry, and so is the fact that he doesn't really use his his size or length to box people out, which is what he was billed as being an ex-basketball player. He is underrated as a blocker though, so he, for me he's a good. Round 4 is where Pace really made his money in that draft, and that's Eddie Jackson and Tariq Cohen. Safety from Alabama, running back from North Carolina a t Eddie Jackson, what can you say about him that isn't just a superlative you've already heard? He's on, tr- on track to beat many records that are held by Ed Reed for defensive touchdowns via very different men- many methods, and he looks to be an absolute stud every single year that we've had to play him. Tariq Cohen, he's a mismatch nightmare to be used by Nagy in various different plays, can even pass the ball. He's a quality wide receiver who can't be covered by most defensive backs in the league, let alone one and one with any linebacker. He would be an elite running back itself if his vision was a little bit better. Better. He has shown some issues there, but overall, he's a stud. Round 5, Jordan, Jordan Morgan cuts down offensive line. Uh, dud. We still have uh, three guys from the practice squad that were, were picked up in undrafted free agency in that year, and that's Michael Joseph, defensive back, Ryan Knoll, running back, and cornerback Kevin Tulliver, all of which are showing could um, certainly have done well enough in the preseason games to be able to show that they need to stick around. So on to 2018, round one, Roquan Smith, middle linebacker, 
absolute stud. The guy flies around. Yes, he missed some time at the start of the season, but he's shown that he not only is able to now read and play fast, but he hits like a train as well, and he's great in pass coverage. So he's a stud, and he's a, a surefire starter for many years with us. James Daniels, guard now moving back to centre again for me for where he was picked his age his level of development from college going into pros he's going to turn out to be an absolute stud and I'm interested to hear what the guys say about that round two Anthony Miller wide receiver also a stud he's played hurt all of last year and I don't think any of us really realised it until the end of the season when it was obvious that he was injured so stud for me seven touchdowns we're going to see much more improvement from him this year I believe Round four, Joel Iggy Iggy. What can you say? He's middle linebacker, absolutely flying on the field in that game against the uh, the Vikes, and, and, and certainly in the playing time they're going in the Packers. It looks like it could be uh, the replacement for Danny Trevathan, already in house. So for me, he's a could, possibly turning into a stud. Round five, Bill Al Nichols. What can you say? The guy is an absolute behemoth. He's an absolute stud for me, bearing in mind where he was picked and the production we've already seen from him last year. Looking at him this off-season, he looks like he's taken another step to me. So, absolute stud. Round sixth, Kylie Fitz, that's a cud for me. He has shown some ability, but like uh, Danny Shimon said, has shown also some difficulty in actually bending the edge and getting hands off. Javon Wims, wide receiver, seventh round, wide receiver. He looks like he could be a stud, but at the moment he's a cud. So that's it from me, Bellissimo, and I hope you've enjoyed this segment, and I'm looking forward to hearing what your thoughts are on it on uh, Twitter. So hit me up at Bellissimo, looking forward to hearing what the guys have to say. Over to you. I want to tell our audiences here that uh, this is not the last Draft on Tap. We have several more, including a live Draft on Tap next Wednesday. April 24th, we're going to have a roundtable. There are going to be a number of people on our show. We're going to do mock drafts. We're going to talk for hours. It's going to be a giant size draft on tap show on the eve of round one of the NFL draft on round one, the Thursday 25th. Since the Bears don't have a draft pick, we're all going to just sit back at our homes, throw draft parties, drink beer, and then we'll regroup on Friday the 26th and go on live. Uh, We're not quite sure on the starting time, but it will probably be after that 87th pick of the Chicago Bears, and we'll diagnose who the Bears pick with that third-round pick. And who knows, maybe Ryan Pace is going to... Uh, trade up into the second round in which case we'll be on earlier but but stick with us we're going to be on friday the 26th on the 27th which is the day uh, day, day three of the draft we're going to sit back and and gather up all the information about these draft picks and then on sunday the 28th we'll be back here with a cavalcade of analysts looking at every chicago bears draft pick and undrafted free agent Shane's going to be on the road that day, so he's going to call in with an assessment, uh, and we will uh, have lots of other people uh, giving their two cents, three cents, 25 cents, two dollars, a hundred dollars worth of opinion on on the draft picks. So that's our schedule for the draft on tap shows, and then we're targeting Bears 100 proof to come back early in May. Guys, any final words before we say goodnight? We're we're coming down the home stretch, and I couldn't be any more excited. Like I said, it's we don't have a top ten pick, a first round pick, a second round pick. But I just I think about Khalil Mack. I think about Anthony Miller. These guys have to factor in to, to next week. They just they just do. Uh, as much as I love having picks, I wouldn't ship either of them to get those picks back. Obviously. They're huge. I mean, they're still – Khalil Mack is, what, 27 years old still? It's crazy to even think about. But um, it, it's going to be a whole bunch of fun, and it just – where are you going to find a room full of degenerates like us that are getting excited <laughs> about drafting somebody 87th overall? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts? Just want to echo what Shane just said. It is basically, I mean, you know, we've gone on and we, we've given you guys prospects at running back, at tight end, at – edge and we're, we're talking about corner probably and safety as well but I mean, we haven't covered all of them and, and then colin just gave us some more names tonight that we haven't even talked about but just to show you that there is talent in this draft so yeah. because you don't have exactly because you don't have a first round or a second round pick does not mean 
that you're not going to get talented player does not preclude you from signing undrafted free agents after the draft. So even once the draft is done, stick with us here at the bar room because we're we're going to be we're going to be filling you in on on the guys that they're drafting. You know, in terms of what their their uh, the positives are, their negatives are. You know, if we got if I have tape, I'll I'll, I'll send out a tape on them. But the guys, th- this draft is is going to be uh, one that that's going to produce, if not one or two, at least three or four players for the Bears. Uh, because as we've gone over and have talked, they need they have roster spots. They got to fill those spots, and they're, they're going to bring in not only this this five picks, if not more, but they're going to sign a lot of guys after the draft. And and just stay tuned to the bar room. We're going to fill you in on all these guys and what they do best. I'm not going to be surprised if there's two or three UDFAs that they bring in that we like more than somebody that they drafted. Because mm-hmm. yep. I think that there's going to be a bunch of them. There's going to be UDFAs that. We thought should have been drafted. Right, right, yep. And I, uh, I, I expect that uh, they'll go, at, they'll double up. They'll draft the running back and then assign a UDFA and and tight end yeah. and, and some of the other positions. You might see that that happen. I, I think that's very likely to happen. I'm super excited about what's ahead. I really love this part of the season. I mean, I love this as much as I like the games. And I know that's weird, but I just love the whole idea of scouting football players, identifying what their strengths and weaknesses are, trying to find the spot with them within the Chicago Bears, playing that whole general manager. This is real fantasy football for me. And uh, it's, it's much more gratifying for me than, than playing fantasy, which is a game that I've enjoyed for many years. But this is, this is the real stuff, and it's just a lot of fun to – to talk about what ifs and who could be and, and so forth and doing it. Better with. than Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a debate I still have from not some... watched the show. Me either. You, you guys haven't watched a single episode. Neither Never one of you. Never seen it. All right. Single episode, nope. Well, if if you if you don't mind watching uh, people fucking and uh... – Actually, I got I to gotta be honest. The other night, I, I told myself, I'm like, I wonder if I should turn that on. I flipped it over, and there was a dude laying down, and there was three naked <laughs> <Exactly>. chicks. <laughs> she got up on top of him and started having sex with him for like three seconds, and then they were like, the queen wants to see you. He's like, okay, I got to go. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, that's the show. Just that's getting that's... good. So like, I turned it off. Yeah, and then if, if there's that kind of stuff, and there's heads being chopped off, and there's dragons, <laughs> if, if you don't like that stuff, then yeah, you don't, you don't want to watch Game of Thrones. Uh, but uh, but uh, we've got plenty of stuff for you guys in the uh, next uh, couple of weeks, draft action, and then uh, the action continues here at Bears Bar Room throughout the offseason as we'll be covering OTAs, we could be covering minicamp, we'll be covering all sorts of stuff. So, And a lot of fun uh, 100 Proof coming uh, shows coming up. We're going to do a lot of fun stuff, so more news on that later. Guys, uh, pretend that there's background music, and I'm going to say... Uh, if you drink, please don't drive and always bear down! Oh, wow.